Hey everybody, welcome to DevFest Day 2, track number two. Super excited to be here. I'm Danny Thompson. I work on the Dev Ecosystem team here at Google. And I'm Karina Liu, and I'm also on the North America Developer Ecosystem team as well, working with Danny. Welcome to DevFest Day 2. All right, before we get started, I just want to cover a few quick reminders. So this is an inclusive event, and we want to make sure we have a zero tolerance for any form of harassment. So please be respectful to one another and uh, follow the community guidelines and the details provided in this link if you haven't already done so. Yesterday's event um, was super engaging. So let's keep that up today as well and continue those conversations in the in the chat as well and ask any questions that you have with to the speakers on there. They'll be, be able to answer them throughout the, the sessions. And if you haven't already joined the Slack group, feel free to do so via this link here so you can connect and network with everyone on here and continue those conversations. With every event, we always strive to improve and appreciate your input. So please share your feedback with us for all the sessions. We'll be raffling off many more prizes here for completed surveys. And lastly, don't forget to use these hashtags to share your participation in this event on your social channels. Now over to you, Danny, um, and we'll cover the agenda for track two. Absolutely. Are you changing the slide? There we go. Uh, change it. There we go. The agenda. So today, this track is going to be my favorite track personally. So this track is focused on introducing you to maybe some technologies that you're not used to as of yet, but also helping you get the applied skills that you need to grow in your professional career. Whether you're trying to get your first job in tech or your next job in tech, we have the resources to help you jump to that level. So immediately, we're about to jump into a talk that I've been looking forward to. It's an intro to Jetpack Compose with Philip Lackner. After that, we have our introduction to Flutter with Nila Yenner from the Flutter dev team. After that, we have our resume workshop. It's going to be improving your resume with practical strategies from the, Google, the Grow with Google uh, team that we have here at Google. After that, we have a LinkedIn crash course with yours truly. I wasn't planning on doing that, but it was requested, so we went ahead and threw that in there. Then we're doing our Power Your Job Search with Google Tools, also with the Grow with Google team, followed by our finale, which is our panel of hiring managers. These are hiring managers from several tech companies across North America, offering you very actionable steps and strategies to stand out in that interview process and really ace that next interview. We want to help you all get those jobs. After that, we'll finish off with closing remarks. Please, yesterday's chat was incredible. So much great ideas and conversations had. Drop your questions in the chat. We'll make sure that all the speakers, we try to get to as many as we can. After the speaker sessions, they will be in the Slack channel. So if you're not in the Slack channel, make sure you're joining there. Also, one question I have, since we're introducing you to several uh, new technologies, can you drop in the chat right now? How familiar are you with Android? Is it something brand new to you? Is it something that you're very experienced with? Love to see where you are with your understanding of that. And without further ado, I think we should bring up our next speaker and let this get this uh, agenda on the road. Sounds good. Let's welcome Philip. All right. Philip. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited for this, Philip. Um, I know your teaching style is a very interesting one and it's an engaging one, but also I know there are a lot of people in the chat that are Philip Lackner fans, and I'm really excited to see your take on your introduction to Jetpack Compose. Awesome, very excited as well. Thanks for having me. All right, the floor is yours. All right, welcome everybody. I'm Philip, and in case you don't know me yet, I am a native Android development teacher on YouTube where I basically just have the goal and the mission of making the world a better place by helping people to build their dream Android projects, you can say. And today we're talking a little bit about Jetpack Compose. If you've never heard that before, no issues. After this talk, you will definitely have an understanding of what that actually is. So far about this, who are you actually? I would love to know more about you. I'm pretty sure you have a favorite technology. I would love to know what that actually is. So. Spam the chat, guys, and let's find out what kind of developers we actually have here. So let's see. Ah, yeah, it's just working on app development. That's awesome. Welcome, Arjun. Yes, we're going to learn Jetpack Compose today. Welcome, Avid. And I've also seen my good friend Florian in here. 
web developer here. Yeah, I feel like web is taking over the world right now. Front end web developer, Python, Node, so many cool technologies. Thanks for joining all this uh, talk here today. If you're seeing this, then you might already have an impression of what, what this talk will be about and what Jetpack Compose is about. It's in the end about Android UIs. What that exactly means is, so what the heck is now Jetpack Compose? It's in the end a new way of making UIs for native Android. And to better understand this, we first need to take a look at the, at the current way, or rather the, the most popular way, how we do that right now. And that is with XML files. So that would be how we define a simple text. And I think I have a laser pointer here. Yep, that is how we define a simple text with the most popular way of UI design in Android, just by putting that in an XML file. It's a text view in Android. We can give it some styling, like the text color, text size, text style, and stuff like that. Text width, height, all that stuff. So that's how we used to do it. However, now Google came up with a new approach and a new framework, which is called Jetpack Compose. And the new approach does not use XML anymore. Instead, now we actually do that with Kotlin only. So in the past, Google went with this Kotlin first approach, and it's now taking that to the next level that we even make all of our app in, Jetpack, in, in Kotlin. So even the UI actually. And this is basically how the, the text view from XML would translate to a text made in Jetpack Compose. So we, it looks quite similar here. And I know this might not be too clear yet why this is a, in my opinion, superior approach and better way to do it. But it still gives you already a little impression of how this will look like. So we basically just describe how our UI looks like and we do that in Kotlin. But to better understand this, how this works. Let's take a look at the screenshot. So this is from an app that I actually built in my regular Twitch live sessions. So I'm doing that regularly on Twitch, where I build an app together with my community using Jetpack Compose. So this is all done with that new way of designing UI with Jetpack Compose. And let's think about how we now approach making our UI. In the end, we take a look at your, at your mockups or so. And then we divide these into single components. So if you're a web developer or so, then you will know this way of making UIs. It's called declarative UI design because we more like declare how our UI looks like. We describe that. And if we take a look here, then there are elements that actually repeat themselves, like this profile info count, how I call it here, for example. You can see that it's also like in apps like Instagram. We have a follow account that consists of a single count and a description what that count actually reflects. And we have that multiple times in our app here on our, on our screen. And with the old way of making, of making that in XML, we would need to define every single text, like the text for the count and the text for the description, actually three times for this layout. If we would need that in other screens as well, then we would also need to repeat it at that point. However, with Jetpack Compose, the approach is differently because we can now define these so-called components. So the profile info count would be a so-called component here. In Jetpack Compose specifically, we call these composables. So when I speak of components or composables here, these are basically equivalent. And by putting single UI elements like a text here together in such a composable, that allows us to easily reuse that now in our layout, because in the end, all that changes here is the data that they that these composables reflect, because the, the followers count could be different from the following count and the post count, and the description will differ. But in the end, like the styling, the alignment of the text or the color, that in the end stays the same. So in the end, we just need to define that once, we reuse re it over and over again, and we can now do that for our whole layout. So. Our profile picture could also be such a composable. So in the end, if we need that at different places in our app, then we can also just reuse that there. So we would only need to define that this has this little border here once. We would need to define that it is round only once, and then we can reuse it. And the same way, 
if we already define some composables, we can also have other composables that combine these again. So we could have this profile header section that contains like our profile picture. Then here, another one where I don't have a box yet for, but everything that is kind of a UI element here would be considered a composable. And it also contains these three profile info counts. So just that you get an impression of how this looks like. In the end, you can think of one screen now as one big single composable, and it forms some kind of hierarchy with smaller and smaller composables that in the end get, um, get down to, yeah, just a single one, like a single text, like a single image here or so. And yeah, that, that helps us now to make our UI components a lot more reusable and to eliminate a lot of boilerplate code. However, because I think that this is not, yeah, it, it, it might not get too clear here when we just talk about that. That's why I actually want to build something live with you together here, because I think then you just get a little more impression of what Compose is actually about and how that works. So let me quickly jump into Android Studio. Right here, mm, yeah, you can see that, perfect. So in case you're not familiar with Android at all, then this is already <laughs> quite some code that requires a little explanation. So in Android, we have these so-called activities, which pretty much reflect single screen in Android. So we have this main activity. And when that single screen is created, this onCreate function is called. So far, so good. So what's now new in Compose is the set content function. So this comes from the Compose framework. And it does pretty much what the name already says. It sets the content of our screen. So whatever comes inside of this blog now will be composed content. So in the end, these composables that I talked about are functions in Kotlin. So maybe when I quickly go back to my slides here to show you that. Um, here, the, this text, for example, this is not a class or so in Kotlin, that is a function. And that's how we now structure our UI. Mm. So these functions can now be called in the set content block. Let's actually see how this works. Um, what this theme here is for, I will get to that in a moment. Or I can also explain it now. It's basically just also composable that gives us access to theming variables like the colors, like font style, so that we don't need to hard code that in our project and we only need to change it at one place. But that's really not relevant for this uh, simple demonstration here. It's just what on Android Studio generates when we create a new project. Let's actually start by creating a composable function. So you can see that's a normal Kotlin function. We call it def fast elements because this composable here doesn't do anything specific. It's just to show you how that actually works. And it's also worth mentioning that these composable functions all start with a capital letter. That's not how we usually call our functions. Usually we use camel case for that. So starting with a lower letter, but to be able to distinguish these from other functions in Kotlin, we start these with a capital letter. And the difference to a normal Kotlin function is that these are actually now annotated with at composable. So that is what makes a, a function a composable and allows it to be rendered on our screen. You can also see that we have a preview block here. Uh, rather a preview annotation. This preview annotation, you can see that on the right side here, will lead to the, um, will actually help us to see what we're building. Because right now we don't have that layout editor anymore, which we have with XML, where we could simply drag and drop UI elements. Since we now declare all that in Kotlin, it's still helpful to sometimes have that little preview. And that's what that is for. So I think this is zoomed pretty strongly. Oh, that's actually, let's build and refresh. That's still from the preparation here. So right now we don't see anything because obviously nothing is in our set content block here. Let's change that by actually, first of all, calling our composable function here. So we created that function and now we call it in the set content block to include it in our layout. However, since this function is still empty, it won't do anything right now, but it will when we put some other composables into that. Let's start with a column. So column is in composed in the end, just a layout. 
and it does pretty much what it says. So it's it's just used to arrange uh, UI elements in a column-wise fashion, so like that. So they that they are not stacked on top of each other, and we don't see um, some elements because they are like behind other elements. That's why we use a column. So we have one element at the top, in the middle, the bottom, or whatever. And here we can now, you can see we on the one hand have these parentheses where we can pass parameters to customize that column. And we have a block of curly braces where we can put in other composables. So these composables that we now put inside of this column will, will be the children of the column, you can say. Let's first of all take a look here. We can, for example, say that the vertical arrangement of this column is centered. So that will now just center our elements in on the vertical axis. And we can, of course, also do this for the horizontal axis. So we could say horizontal alignment is center horizontally. So far, so good. Right now, we even if we build and refresh, we don't see anything here because the, the column doesn't, doesn't really look like something. We, and we didn't really put any composables into this column. To change that, let's get to another concept that we have in Compose. And this is actually quite a unique concept because even though this way of declarative UI design is very popular nowadays in other web frameworks like React, Angular, and stuff like that, I haven't seen this approach of having these modifiers anywhere else. So what the heck is a modifier? In the end, well, they used to modify something, obviously, but we, we often have some type of configuration and styling that we want to be able to have for every single composable out there. For example, as you can see, we can say modifier.fill max size because every composable, no matter what that is, we want to be able to assign a size for that. So we can say, okay, we apply a modifier and we want to fill the maximum size. So that will fill all the size that this composable, this column here actually has. So it will, if, if the size is actually limited by the parent, it will fill as much as the parent allows it. And if there is no parent, it will just fill the whole size of our screen. What we could also do is we could assign this background modifier to actually assign a background color to our column. In this case, we just say, okay, this is black. And if we now actually build and refresh this, the, the preview here and zoom out, like this, then you can see this is now what we build with this column. We don't see anything of the centers uh, yet because we don't have any children, but we can already see the background color. If we change this to red here, for example, and build and refresh, then <laughs> guess what happens? Surprise, surprise. It's going to be a red background. I'll switch this back. And let's actually now put some elements into this column so we actually see something. On the one hand, uh, images are always cool. Let's add some images here. This is just something, a composable that comes from the Compose framework. And with these painters, we can simply load an image from our resources. So you can see I created a little meme here that I'd like to show here in, in our app. So we simply link to that meme with, our, um, with its ID from the drawable folder. And you can see we still get an error here because every image in Compose actually needs to have a content description. So we want to add that. A content description in the end is just used for accessibility. So you, you can imagine if there's someone who's blind and can't see that image, then the Android system or the accessibility, accessibility service of Android could then read the content description to that blind person so they can still understand what that image would be about. And Compose forces you to implement that, which is good, of course. And let's next actually declare a little text. So the, the text composable is something you already saw in my slides. And guess what? We can simply define a text here for that. Welcome to Google DevFest. And we could make the text bold, for example, if we now build and refresh this so we can see the, the preview. Sadly, th this doesn't work with um how's it called like hot reload this does not exist for compose at least yet um you can see we can see the image but we can't really see the text but we can see that there is still a box that occupies space for the text so the reason for that is that the the default text color is just black and we now have black text on a black background which of course isn't readable we will change this later 
But before that, I want to add one final UI element here, which is a button. Usually, when we have a button, we want to be able to click on it, and we want something to happen in that case. That's why we're first to implement this on click function. So whatever comes in here will be executed when we click on that button. This is very similar to what we had with the old approach, where we had an on-click listener or so. And then we have another block of code here, which is in the end a row scope. So the same way as we have columns, we also have rows that just arrange items in a row-wise fashion. And whatever we put in here will then be displayed on our button. Usually, that's just a text, like here, like click me. But you could also imagine to have some kind of progress bar in that. So when you maybe you want to create a post and you click on that button, that you then show a progress bar next to that. So this stuff now got really easy with Compose. In XML, that was already a little bit tricky to make this customized UI. But now we actually have a lot, have a much easier way to do that. However, now we actually defined these UI components, but we actually would like something to happen when we click on this button. So you can see there's our button, our text is still black. So what I want to do is I want to actually make the text color green. When we click on this button, we want to change it to red. And if it's red and we click on the button, we want to change it back to green. And here, there is a new big concept of Jetpack Compose that often confuses people when they switch from the old way to the new way, and that is called state. So in the old way, where we had this Android view system, we rather sent commands to these views. So we had a text view, and then we could say text view dot set text color or so to color dot red. Now that works differently. Now we have state. So state in the end is any value that can change over time. So would this background color, for example, be state here? No, it wouldn't, because we hard code this background color to be black. However, if we would like to change this background color over time, then we would need to create a state for that. And as soon as the state changes, this column would recompose. That's how we call it when a, when a composable actually is redrawn on the screen, is updated on the screen with the corresponding new color that we assigned. Let's actually see how that works with a text color. So we can define that text color as such a mutable state off here. And this is the initial value of that, which is green here. The remember block, all that does is that we, we just make sure that the mutable state here is initialized once. So even if this devfest elements block recomposes and updates in future, we don't call this block again. So we don't reinitialize that and set it back to green. That's why you should always use these states in combination with remember. Now, if you want to change the state, this text color, we first want to assign that to our text. So we actually make sure that the text color reflects whatever is in our state. So we can say text color dot state. And then in our button on click function, we can say, OK, the new, the new value of our text color state is actually depending on the current value of that. So if the current value is green, we switch it to red. And else, if it's currently red, we switch it back to green. And as soon as we execute this, so as soon as we say state.value is something new, that it is actually a new value and not the same one, that will trigger a so-called recompose. So then Jetpack Compose will realize that, and it will automatically detect all the places where this state is used, which in, in this app is just this text composable. And then only this component and composable in our UI will update correspondingly, reflecting the new text color here. So I think this is actually already enough to try this out. I won't build this here because I have pre-built this. Otherwise, we would need to wait for Gradle here for ages. Um, so this is, in the end, how this would look like. You already saw that from the preview. Nothing new, just that the text is now green because it reflects the initial color here of our state. But if we now click this button, boom, it suddenly switches to red. And if we click it again, it switches to green. Because as soon as we click it, we change our state. And then we change, yeah, we change the color that is saved in that state, which will trigger this recompose. So this text will, in the end, be updated from the compose framework. And this is now often, as I said, really confusing for new people. 
who don't know this declarative UI, uh, UI approach because we don't really, for example, save this text in a reference or so, and then say like that set text color or so. This is what we Android developers like to intuitively do because that's how we did it in the past with XML, but not anymore. If you are, however, a web developer, iOS developer, Flutter developer, then you will know this concept already and it will be quite familiar to you. So that is pretty much actually it, what I wanted to show you. Mm. In case you would like to learn more about me and more about Android, then here's my YouTube link. You will find regular Android tutorials there about pretty much everything. So definitely worth to, to take a look there. And I'll now be happy to answer some of your questions. Absolutely. So we have quite a few questions come in, and we're going to try and definitely get to quite a few of them. Um, the very first question that we have, and I'll remove that there, is do you set up the constraint in Compose as well? So yeah, in Compose, we do have a constraint layout. However, you can, in Compose, build your whole UI with these rows and columns. And we also have boxes to align composables properly. In XML, we used constraint layout to get rid of this deep nesting of layouts. However, Compose is built in a way that this is not an issue anymore in terms of uh, like that is not unperforming anymore. So you can build your UI only with rows and columns, and you're totally fine with doing that. However, for some purposes, it's totally fine to also use the constraint layout, which you, I think, need a dependency for. It's, for example, useful if you have these constraint animations and you want to animate some kind of composable to somewhere on your screen. And you, it's just helpful to have a constraint layout for that. But I personally never used it in any app yet. OK. Good question, Godfrey. And now we have Vidyesh here with the question of, do I need to delete Compose Preview before publishing to the Play Store? Can Preview cause any security issues? Uh, what kind of Preview? I mean, the Preview is just the local thing for your Android Studio that does not have much to do with releasing to Play Store, if I'm understanding the question correctly. It's just, to, uh -huh. it's just a replacement kind of for the layout editor that we don't have anymore. All right. Uh, Ariberto here, is there some type of state management system, something like Redux slash context? Yeah, so not really something like Redux or context, but we we kind of use the, the approach we also used before, that we use a proper architecture for our apps. That's typically MVVM and Android. And then you just have your view model. So that is bound to your actual UI layer. And the view model then keeps your state. Because in Android, we have this concept of screen rotations, which then destroys your activity. State is lost. And to prevent that, we put our state in view models. And that way, we, yeah, we make sure that our state is actually kept when there is some kind of configuration change, like a screen rotation. So I'm not really trying to get into like what technology is better. But I, I know this topic is coming up because we're talking about Jetpack Compose and Declarative mm -hmm. UI. So like, what are some advantages someone would have by building a native app over using a cross-platform solution? Does the performance different or what aspects would you see? Would it be maybe because you can focus on the way it actually performs and looks on one set of um, platforms versus you know just being OK across others? Like, what, what would your ideas be there? Yeah, so of course performance, uh, as you already said. On the other hand, there are just things you need native code for. Like if you have a uh, specific hardware access that you need, like if you need access to the sensors, to camera, microphone, then even if you choose something like Flutter, you need some kind of plugins that need to be written in native language. And the more of these platform specific things you have, the more sense it makes to me to make a native app. That's one thing. Also, what I think is, if you really want your app to have that native feel, um, you, you will feel that if you have an app that is just natively written in iOS or Android, it just has that typical yeah, that typical Android feel. And if you do that in Flutter, then it will just look the same on Android and iOS. So if that's important to you, then I would also pick a native app. Yep, and the other thing too, one thing that I really wanna highlight is it's not necessarily a, a thing of which one is better, but even uh, we did a Between the Brackets episode, and if you haven't seen it, it's on this YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed, definitely subscribe so you catch all the future content. But uh, the episode that we did was with somebody from the Flutter dev team where 
basically they kind of said if you need the best practices on Android, you need to follow what Android is saying. Flutter isn't replacing what Android development is. It's only enhancing or creating a cross-platform solution across multiple platforms. So you shouldn't be looking at it as which one is better and it's going to wipe away the other. There's use cases for all. Yeah. And I think making sure that you have that use case in mind can give you the right tool. It's like you know React, Angular, et cetera. They're great tools. You just need to make sure you're using the right tool to solve the right problem. So it's not like which one better or worse, but make sure you're using the right options. Philip, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thanks Thank you for so having much me. for doing this. You were incredible. Even the, the chat has been on fire pretty much this whole time. Yeah, I haven't you seen really it. Explained but, uh, it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am hoping that you'll be in the Slack channel. So if, if y'all course, are yeah. not in the Slack channel, um, check that out as soon as this talk is over. And if you have any more questions, you can ask them to fill up there. Exa yeah. And the chat is not saying, you know, you did a great job. We loved it. La, la, la. So definitely check out that Slack channel. And Philip will be there for like the next 15 or so minutes talking, answering questions, and sharing links. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. And Thank have you, a nice bro. rest of the day and uh, many new learnings. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. And our next speaker coming up, if because I know we've had quite a few questions on the subject of Flutter and these other tools. If you have never utilized Flutter, and I know we have quite a few people in here that are brand new to mobile development, this is going to be a session for you. So we are actually going to be joined with Nila Yanir from the uh, she's the program manager on the Flutter DevRel team. Nila, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you, Danny. How are you? I'm great. I'm excited for this talk. I've been looking forward to it. Um, without you. further ado, Nila, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I was just listening to Philip's talk, and I, I saw that there were a few questions related to Flutter or Jetpack Compose on Android or Native. And uh, Danny told Danny like said something great that like they 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 are all technologies, uh, different technologies, different opportunities, and it's it's you that you should decide whatever is gonna work for you. So today I'm gonna talk about Flutter. Uh, this talk will be an introduction to Flutter. Uh, if you don't know about Flutter, where it came from, how you can, what, how you can use it, this talk is for you. Uh, also, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the ecosystem. So who is using Flutter? How can you get, um, get involved in the Flutter world? Um, so yeah, so first of all, my name is Nilay, and I work in the Flutter DevRel team. Uh, as a program manager, uh, you might have seen you might have seen me on Twitter and and a lot of community things related to Flutter because I work on the community of programs for Flutter, and um, so yeah. So let's let's see. Let's start what, with what Flutter is. So all right, let, how do I go to the next slide? <laughs> okay, cool. So let's see. Yes, it's working. Yay. So as you can see, I'm not I'm not a really experienced presenter, but I'm so excited to talk here. I don't have a professional setup or anything. I I, can, I hope you can hear me well. Um so Flutter, Flutter is a an SDK, a, a a UI toolkit from Google that will allow you to build beautiful applications for multi-platform, for mobile, for web, for desktop, for any screen screen devices uh, from one single code base. And uh, like, where did it come from? Like, why why did it, how how people decided to do Flutter, right? Um, actually, so let me go look. The, so actually, it was. Um, uh, three engineer at Google, uh, I, six around like six, seven years ago, they were working in the web team and then they were like playing around with technologies. Okay, how can we make this a smooth ex web experience on the mobile devices? And they started building Flutter. So Flutter was born in Google uh, for from those three engineers. And then they first started it doing it with JavaScript and then Oh, uh, things didn't go as they expected. And then they decided to use Dart, Dart programming language to build Flutter itself. Dart is also a programming language from Flutter, uh, from Google. And they built uh, Flutter with Dart. 
and then uh, also to build flutter applications the programming language you use is also there so and then why right so i told you that like that smooth uh, experiences on the on web how they were experimenting how we could build this experience on also mobile devices this is how they started and if we also go back to history and look at look at the mobile application development Pro, uh, processes ways uh, there were two ways right one is you could either you can either build a, a native application uh, android application for android devices using kotlin or java or ios applications for iphones like apple devices using with swift ui and um these are of course very uh, performance applications, very high quality applications, because those applications are specifically built for those devices, right? They are native applications. And this is why you have very high quality applications. But let's say that you built your Android app and also you want to have an iOS app. So which means that you need another another developer or another team or you yourself need to learn also Swift UI to build your iOS application. And if you also think about web and desktop and other, like these are all different technologies. So you will have to learn all of those technologies or need different developers to be able to build those applications. So at the end, yes, your applications are beautiful, very high quality applications, but this is a very costly way of doing that. And then, uh, there were other cross-platform solutions, right? In the past, like PhoneGab or Adobe Air, right? They were allowing you, so, okay, you don't need to learn all those different technologies. You can build only one single code and produce applications for any devices, for mobile, for Android, for iOS, but they were not native applications. They were, you were building web, views into mobile shell so actually your application is a web view working in the mobile mobile device mobile shell so you don't have that smooth experience and performance experience on the mobile applications and so and someone made this meme on google uh, on the internet we just stole it from there you could either build a high quality castle but it might be a little bit uh difficult to go to that like like you need you might need to spend some time and effort to do that or if you want to skip that high cost but the result might not be what you wanted so flutter exactly came came from from this idea that i'm going back to the previous slide flutter allows you to build native applications so your applications at the end are going to be native applications uh, but from one single code base you don't have to write different codes to make your app uh, work on the on different devices and uh, this is another code that like it is literally now i have like we have, we have screens on every devices right like when you you build your application you want your application uh, to work on every devices a lot of devices and if if that's your goal then flutter is a great great option for you this is this is where you can choose your flutter i want my application to work on any devices any screens no matter what then flutter is a good option for you now flutter supports ios android web and desktop on desktop windows mac os linux and also embedded devices you can use flutter on the embedded devices and um and what well, like how flutter works right how did they build it so the flutter is actually a an engine like Sakia. it is built over Sakia engine it's like the game you can think about it as like the game engine for the application there is an engine and on top of engine, there's a framework part that was built with Dart, and on that, everything is a widget. So, it, so if you want to uh, add like pages or animation or like scrolls and gestures, everything is widget on coming on top of each other. So this is a very layered structure. And let's say that if you want to build Android, like if you want your app to look like Android app, there are material widgets for that. You can use those ready material widgets. Or if you want your app to look like an iOS app on iPhone, you can use Cupertino widgets. So it, it, it looks like an uh, iOS app. Or no, I don't want this, I want my own branding 
what is going to look like every same on every screen, it's possible to build your own design and own, own, own widgets to do that. So this is where Flutter gives you a lot of flexibility. Also, another thing is that that layered uh, the structure um, is uh, making your life is very easy as a developer because if you decide to make any changes at any point you just go back to that layer and do the change so you don't have to structure everything from scratch so this is what flutter promises you as well also you can your your as a developer your life will be very easy to build the application so now we talk about like five foundational pillars of Flutter. You can build fast applications with Flutter. You can, you can be productive as a developer. You can build beautiful applications. And also Flutter is open source. Flutter is not just Google's or Flutter team's product, but you can also do contributions for Flutter. This is an open source project. And also Flutter is portable. It can, you can, ship applications wherever you want to be and let's look at a little bit detail on these pillars and um, flutter allows you to make like very like very fast and performant applications and because the code you write compiles directly to native code on the devices this is why it's the application uses the all power of your device and this is how your app becomes very powerful and people are usually asking like what's the different bit the first bit between react native and flutter and here is one difference so on react native there are bridges in between the screen the device and also the code the like javascript bridges right flutter doesn't have those bridges so it directly compiles to the native code and this makes your app a little bit performant so they, this is a structural difference between react native and flutter and as you can see there's this is an animation and this is completely like an engine it it, it just it compiles on your screen and it it, it is create it is like a canvas it is created on your screen and uh, play on uh, shown on your screen so this you can build fast and performant applications uh, for with flutter and also flutter gives you productivity and one of the things that i don't know if you know the name that like hot reload right sub second hot reload so and what it is it is like if you make any changes on your app like for example in the screen you want to make any change on this screen right you want to change color text or anything you want to add something and once you add it you don't have to rebuild all your code to see the change on the emulator because of the hot reload you will be able to see the change in only a few seconds on the screen and this gives you productivity because it is so easy for you to oh i want to try this i want to try and see this and try and see this this brings productivity and also creativity while you are building applications also flutter is beautiful flutter it allows you to build beautiful applications and it's all because of those like widgets design widgets there are a lot of a lot of uh, ready to use widgets you can use you can build beautiful applications or you can create create your own branding uh, designs and um, add your add to your app so usually you might be familiar that like if you work in a team that there are designers there are developers and if like when developers go to design they're like oh, can you please change this on the design or when designers make any new design can you please implement this into the app and th this is not a pleasant experience all the time right but with flutter it's it's all like you build your ui with the widgets with the design so you don't have to to um go through all those processes again and flutter is open source everything is free and everything is open source if you go to github you will see the flutter team and other community members are doing contributions to flutter and this is not only flutter's code base yes you can uh, do contributions to flutter code base but also packages right there are so whatever in if you want to make any integration into your app like you want to add machine learning you want to add map or you want to add google ads to your app these are all packages so you just use packages to add them to your app and there are so many packages are created by the uh, non-Googlers, external community, external companies and community. So people, let's say that 
some company or someone is building an app and they needed something and it does not exist and they just build the package and then someone else is using this package and they say oh i also can add this to the i can also make this package this way and they can also contribute to that package and because of this collaborative environment um the the the, the ecosystem and the flutter is so powerful um it is how flutter grows and how you can make more quality high quality applications and of course portable right you just write your code once and your same code runs on every platform you don't have to write separate codes again so now there are over so this might be an old slide it says 150,000 but i know there are there are over 200,000 flooded applications from startups and enterprises and developers on the play store a lot of companies and developers and uh, big companies startups are now using flutter all because of those uh, opportunities opportunities I mentioned here before. And even within Google, uh, a lot of product restarted, uh, rewritten their products like Google Pay or Google AdMob. You know, Google makes its money from Google Ads, right? And Google Ads team built their internal mobile applications where they can see all the dashboards, reporting, like ads, how much money you are making, and also external applications that customers are using. They built those applications with Flutter because they just wanted to like to show the data and pages and just work on any devices. And Google Pay was a big, big thing. They they literally have a lot of users and a lot of pages and they've written all of their uh, application with flutter again and they literally had over a million lines of code and they just they they build it flutter and uh, like this the, microsoft also has been contributing the flutter's code over months over months so now it's not just google as you can see uh, they are bringing flutter support on their foldable devices surface those foldable devices also supporting flutter right now and this is another um a very ex interesting example i wanted to share uh, someone built it in the community if you go there you will see a lot of different uh, web graphics um working on the browser very interestingly if you want to try and see um this is you can you can see it in this link and another another company like irobot right they build an education tool called um irobot education it's like scratch drag and drop uh, coding uh tool and they create the project here and the the applications work on the robots and this entire tool is written with flutter they chose flutter with that and you want to write like the big name in the linux world and now uh linux desktop support flutter and they it is it, it means that it will be very easy for app developers to publish their desktop apps uh, on linux and ubuntu with their support another interesting example that where flutter works on the car like entertainment systems right toyota also chose uh flutter for the 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 screens on the car and also the applications on the mobile and they were talking about the reasons in one of the flutter talks if you search for toyota why toyota flutter ch chose flutter you will see all the reasons they chose flutter and also another thing they were mentioning is that because it's very um uh, fast iterations that they were building the app so they they use flutter for that and of course, like all those packages, right? I mentioned to you, there are over 15,000 packages and um, most of them are written by the external communities. And this, this ecosystem keeps growing, which means that Flutter keeps growing. Flutter is becoming more beautiful, more, more robust. Um, and uh, that is allowing you to build higher quality applications every day. And Flutter, you know, is not, is a young technology. It's been only like a few years we announced the first production version. Uh, it was in 2018 when I joined the team. They announced Flutter 1.0 production version. Now it's in only two or two and a half years or three years, oh, three years, right? Oh my goodness. And then Flutter has grown so much uh, since until, uh, since last three years. 
And so, so I mentioned to you why and how people are using Flutter. And if you're also interested in learning Flutter, uh, I really recommend you our official documentation site, flutter.dev.docs. And also if you search for learning journeys, uh, there are different learning journeys for Flutter for beginner, intermediate, and expert developers. You will see a lot of a set of content created for each different experience. And, uh, and also on the official documentation side, getting started documents are really, really good. It is basically, even if you don't have any experience on Flutter or mobile app development before, if you just follow through all the steps, um, that is very easy. If you are stuck in anywhere, there's a lot of community outside, a lot of Slack channels, groups, and Stack Overflow. People are very friendly and helping. You can ask your questions, and they can help you to get through uh, to, the, to the next steps. And also, um, there are a lot of other ways to be included in Flutter because I told you Flutter is not Google's product. Flutter is an open source technology that is helping everyone to build applications. And there are different ways to be get involved in the Flutter community. And one of the way is Flutter GD. So these are Google developer experts. They're individual people, individual experts on Flutter, but they like helping other people. They are around, they are joining the events, they are making videos, they are writing articles. And if you're one of those people, if you think, oh, I know Flutter, and also I like sharing information, this program might be good for you. Uh, we are very connected with the Flutter GDs. We do monthly meetings. <clears throat> we invite them in our engineering calls. We get them feedback. Uh, so this is also a great uh, opportunity if you are interested. If you want to become a Flutter GD, I'm on Twitter. Search my name. I, I don't know if you can find my name somewhere here, but uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter. You can send me a message, and I can tell you more about how to, how to be a Flutter GD. In another community of Flutteristas, right? So this is a community for women and non-binary developers for Flutter. And uh, they are on Slack. If you go to flutteristas.org, if you scroll down, there's a form. And that's the, how you can join the Slack channel. So this is a bit, an awesome environment to talk to other fellow women and non-binary Flutter developers. Um, this is a safe space. It doesn't mean that rest of the community isn't safe for women and non-binary developers, but it's more about like self of belonging, like sense of belonging, right? You you see other people like you, and then you're like, oh yeah, I'm here, and then I exist, and there are people like me, and we can work together and go to the next step. And of course, another thing, we have also Flutter meetups all around the world. You can see all the meetups in this link here on the screen. Uh, you can join one of the Flutter meetup, attend their meetups. If you're speaking another language, you can go and find a local group that speaks your language. And they are like GDG's Google developer groups, and but just specifically for Flutter. Of course, also GDG's Google developers groups are awesome. Like for example, DevF North America together today hosting us for as Flutter. Um, yeah, this is also another uh, environment that you can find other people. And here are some Flutter meetups. And lastly, um, so you can contribute to Flutter and not only code base, but you can contribute to Flutter's documentation. Uh, you can contribute to Flutter's packages. You can contribute to Flutter. There are so many ways you can fix. You can just say, oh, this word is wrong on the website. I just want to fix it. And you can create a pull request. Or you can say, oh, this is missing. This package is missing, and I want to write that. Or you can see other things. There are a lot of a lot of ways uh, to contribute to Flutter right now. If you are interested, you can check out this. The first article written by a community member. Uh, he outlined it great. And also, there are some guidelines on Flutter's GitHub. You can see how you can start contributing to Flutter. So I hope this was useful. Uh, for all of you, I hope I was able to answer your questions, but that's all from me today. Um, yeah, let's bring up some questions. The chat's been on fire. They really, really love um, <laughs> this topic. So I think okay. uh, it's a, a really interesting one. So mm -hmm. let me go back and pull up some of these questions that the chat has been dropping. Down. All right. Um, 
and they've loved your use of the dash. So oh, and dash thank you. Been... <laughs> yes, and dash, of course, dash is the uh, Flutter's mascot, but you can see it everywhere. <laughs> So we have this um, question here. Uh, I'm just going to rephrase it slightly. So Eshwar asks, does Google monitor, but in reality, does Flutter monitor packages for security? Asking this as NPM recently had a lot of malware issues, is Flutter packages, are they vulnerable as well? Um, okay, sorry. I don't know. I have. I, I don't know if you were hearing my dog, but I'm sorry if it's... Uh, okay. Can that, you hear my dog? Okay, sorry. <laughs> You're good. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay, so someone came into the door this way. So does Flutter monitor Flutter packages for security? If so, there are packages written by Flutter team members or community members, right? And this is usually the package owners are taking care of these issues. And Google, um, Google, if Google is writing the packages, I'm sure. Like I don't know specifically what things they are doing for security, but I am sure that. They, they should be aware of those things. And the other packages that community is reading, it's their ownership. Uh, I, I can't tell specifically if they are doing anything or they, they did anything, but yeah, this is up to package owners. So it's up to the package owners. All yes. right. So Nick asks, just for clarity, does a Flutter app run on top of whatever, the, whatever device it's running on from its own engine or is it running truly natively? So for on top of whatever device it's running on from its own engine or it's running. So it's like uh, it's like um, so when you download your app uh, to your phone and then the, it runs on the apps engine like the Skia, the Flutter, and then it directly compiles into native code. So um, the code compiles into native code. Uh, it works on the phone. But it's the Flutter app has it like it's in this in its structure. It's the Skia. So, but it like since it is compiling the native code, yes, it's a native application. Got it. So, um, one we've had this couple this question come up in different forms a couple times already. But the question being is. Is Dart difficult to pick up for someone to start using for JavaScript uh, from JavaScript or regardless of the programming background? It, it, do you feel the learning curve to pick up Flutter is a little difficult for the average individual or is that something that they can pick up relatively easy? So uh, so this is, again, up to like individual people, like how people learn and what is there. But what I can say is that if you're familiar with any kind of object-oriented programming language, and that is another one. So it's as easy as to learn another programming language, but it's easy. Um, so so you are learning Dart and Flutter together. While you are learning building Flutter application, also you are using Dart, and you, this is not you don't have to learn separate the Dart, but it you can directly start it from, oh, now I want to start building a Flutter application and I'm going to use Dart. So for those who has any programming language experiences, it's easy because it's like just any learning any other programming language. For people who doesn't have any programming language experience, it is also possible. It is also easy because the reason for that, yes, you still have to spend time and like check the articles and the tutorials to learn what it is. But the, the good part is that it's pretty easy to see at screen, like or build your application, because once you uh, do the setup, it starts directly with the empty app. So, and then you start adding on it. So it's so easy to see something, some apps running, and this is a very motivational thing. Like it is not that you have to do a lot of things to see something working. So because of those uh, easy, to, easy to use and like this curve, it's easy to learn. Uh, I can say. I have to add this comment because it almost made me laugh when I read it just now. But um, your dog is guaranteeing Flutter security measures. So yeah, they... <laughs> yeah I have a oh. very I have a guard dog. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So with Flutter, do you still need a Mac for Xcode to do iOS applications? Right, you still need to do Xcode for iOS application. It's uh, it's a part of the installation process. Um, what are the main subjects someone needs to cover in Flutter so they can get to a point where they can start building some applications? Like what would be some areas that you would suggest for them to kind of pay attention to in their learning so that way they can build a couple applications as they're learning and growing? Uh, 
So I'd suggest it, uh, to literally go to official documentation and start with that because that that tutorial literally starts with a easy application and then when you do the installation there's already an app running on the emulator and then you start adding them like widgets and different like pages and different uh gestures and thing and i suggest to build a complete app and to see what the experience is and then you can dive into different approaches because there is not one way doing a flutter applications there are a lot of different ways to use things different so then you once once your app is growing you will need to look at different state management op approaches uh different designer approaches so there are a lot of things that you can add but i suggest to start with this simple app and just continue with it and start adding things on it yeah we had this question come up which i thought was interesting can an app like uber be made on flutter so i don't know what exactly you mean but let's say that uber has a map right like so and then to be able to add a map to your app you need to use package I remember there were some problems using Google Maps and like maps on the Flutter, but now it's improved a lot. I don't know what is the latest situation, but this is one thing to keep in mind. Whenever you need to do some integration, you need to go and check if the package exists uh, or how it how it is working. And but other than that, the other things you can do on Uber, right? Like like simple pages, right? You have your account page, you select things and nice designs, patterns. Yeah, it's like building any other app. It's very easy with Flutter. All right, and our last question from Rafael, how well does Flutter work with cloud platforms? So yeah, actually cloud team and Google specifically work on, on that. Uh, they are to show how you can use Google Cloud on the Flutter apps. They have some courses, I don't know how, links can be found but uh, we can share it later with the resources it's easy it's very easy to use any google products uh, with flutter because we are the reason is that because we are internally connected right it's so easy for flutter team to talk with google cloud team and to create a very seamless easy experience to build on flutter and using firebase using google cloud google cloud is very easy and then for let's say that other cloud platforms like like aws and there is someone literally in Amazon, AWS, he is writing tutorials how to use AWS with Flutter. So people yeah. are also uh, writing a lot of guidelines to how to use uh, things with Flutter because Flutter is basically, you can build applications and you will need a lot of things. One thing that I can say about Flutter that I've seen personally just over the last six months alone, the job market has been growing tremendously and there are tons of opportunities. And when I say like top level fang companies are hiring Flutter developers to, for example, create tutorials with AWS Simplify, uh, Amplify and showcasing how it can ut be utilized together, but also in Microsoft as well, it shows the power and the growth of what's happening um, with the Flutter. One thing that I'm going to ask, Neelai, will you be in the Slack channel after this? Yes. Uh, yes, I'll be there for like, yeah, for some time. Okay. So because we have one question that's come up a couple of times, and I think this would be a perfect question to answer in the Slack channel. Okay. Where can someone get started learning Flutter? And I think yeah. a link to a resource would be great there instead of us kind of just describing. Okay. So if any of you want to learn how to start learning Flutter or any links to the resources, please check out the Slack channel. Neelai will be in there. And Neelai, thank you so much for doing this. It's been incredible. The talk was great. And of course, we love seeing Dash. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Bye. All right, y'all amazing 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 talk before we get to the next talk we are going to do our raffle prize so we will be giving away one swag bundle and we will be giving away one stadia premiere um to be entered in these drawings the only thing that you had to do was register to the event so we have a couple more um raffles that we're doing for the rest of the day if you haven't registered already register now go hit that registration link and make sure that you're registered so you're in there but also Make sure that you drop a like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so you never miss any content coming up after this. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and spin uh, the wheel for the first time and see who we get.
All right, Ross Manges. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Ross, you are good to go there. So uh, we'll be contacting you directly. Uh, we'll email you at the registration email that you have um, on uh, a file with your registration. So let's go on to the next one for the Stadia premiere. Vraj Shah, or maybe it's Viraj. We'll figure that out. But congratulations, Vraj. Uh, we will be contacting you about the Stadia premiere. Thank you so much for um, hanging out with us, y'all. And without further ado, I'm going to be bringing up Israel Serna, who is with the Grow with Google team, and we'll be talking about actionable ways you can improve your resume with practical strategies. Israel, welcome. Hey, Danny. How's it going? Happy Saturday. It it is a Saturday. Um, we're, we're going, and honestly, I'm really excited for this talk. I've got my notepad and my, my Word doc ready to start taking some notes. I'm sure the others are doing the same, um, and I can't wait to see all the advice you share with us. Perfect. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started, Danny. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be participating in DevFest North America. Once again, um, welcome to the webinar titled Improve Your Resume with Practical Strategies, hosted by Grow with Google. We're going to be together here for the next 45 minutes. For those that are not familiar with the Grow with Google program, um, let me mention that this program helps folks like you grow your skills and careers by offering free digital skills training and tools. If you're interested in learning more about the program, I invite you to visit us at grow.google. Today, we're going to review some strategies for making your resume more effective and to avoid major pitfalls that can easily that you can easily fall into. Together, we will review lots of examples and give you some practice. And we'll also give you some tips for how digital tools can make resume writing much easier. We want this to be as helpful as possible. So make sure to post your questions directly in the comment section. We're going to make this uh, presentation very interactive. So be prepared to chat with us via the chat feature. So let's get started. One sec. Okay. Once again, my name is Israel Serna. If you're interested in connecting with me after the session, I will be in the Slack channel, but here's my contact information in case you want to stay in touch. So we're here today to talk about resumes. We're going to break the presentation into three sections. First, we will observe some uh, resume ourselves so that we can develop a sense of what works. Then we will focus on four strategies you can use to make your resume even better. At the end of the session, you'll have a checklist of resume strategies that you can then apply to make your resume more attractive to hiring managers. So let's take a minute to think about the purpose of a resume. How much time on average do you think employers spend looking at a resume? Some people will say five minutes, others will say 10 minutes, some may even say 30 minutes. We often assume that the employer will read our resumes from top to bottom, but that is rarely the case. You may be surprised to know that most recruiters and employers only spend six to 10 seconds looking at a resume. That's right, Leslie um, had said 30 seconds, so you were close, Sam, you nailed it. So we're looking at six to 10, to 10 seconds, which means we have a short window to make an impression on recruiters. So today we're gonna um, complete a challenge. So for the next couple of minutes, I want you to Put yourself in a hiring manager's position, okay? And we're going to be looking um, to fill a position. So we know what we're looking for, but let's just assume we're really busy and we've got a million things to do. And so we only have 30 minutes to review a stack of resumes, okay? Now, we will complete an activity to help you get a sense for how resumes make a first impression. So for this activity... I'm going to ask that you make mental notes of the different resumes, but also share them via the chat, okay? We're going to first look at a job description, so that way we get a good sense for what we're looking for. 
And then we're going to take a look at five resume examples. You're going to have about seven seconds per resume to process the resume. And what I want you to do is I want you to, via the comment section, to write down um, a quick word to describe the resume and then tell me whether or not you would move forward with, with this resume, okay? So again, we're gonna take a look at the job description. The activity here is when I start to show you the resumes is to write down like an adjective, something that comes to mind when you first see the resume and then let me know if you are going to move forward with it or not based on what you're reading here in the job description, okay? So the job description says, we are seeking a high performer to join our sales team. The successful candidate will be responsible, motivated sales associate with proven experience. This person will manage the entire sales cycle, identifying sales needs, locating and expanding new markets, designing and delivering sales presentations, and presiding over negotiations. You will build and maintain expertise about a range of company products and services. To meet or exceed personal and departmental sales goal, you'll need excellent customer service goals, an entrepreneurial worldview, business acumen, and professional sales philosophy. Okay, so remember, I'm going to show you for five to seven seconds a resume, and I want you to write down what you what the first impression is and then whether or not you want to move forward with this candidate so let's start with resume number one let's take a look at what asha has to offer again we're writing down first impression and whether or not we want to move forward with this candidate based on the sales description that we just read okay okay so that was it five to seven seconds went by like that right okay so I know it's a little bit, I, someone's saying that it's a little bit hard to see. So Sabrina, thanks for, um, for mentioning that. I know it's a little blurry, but let's do our best to try to um, read through it, okay? All right, so let's first talk about maybe some strengths, okay? Let's not be too harsh on, on Asha, okay? So for one, we're seeing that there's clear headings, which make it easy for employers to identify the different segments of your resume and narrow in on the important areas of them, okay? They also have really great use of white space and wide margins, which I'm a big fan of. Um, oftentimes, we, we think we need to fill our resumes with, with a lot of content. But those, to me, are just two things that stand out from this resume. Let's talk about the opportunities. So you'll probably notice that Asha doesn't have a lot of experience in sales. She created a skill section at the top of the resume, which can be helpful for employers to get a quick overview of her skills most of these skills aren't relevant to the sales representative position she has applied for. So the lesson here is be sure to build out an overview at the top of the resume that tailors your experience to the position you're seeking. Your experience section should include more details around how you acquired skills in your previous positions, but make sure you highlight the skills that are most relevant to the job you applied for. Okay, let's move on to our uh, to Tyler's presentation. Again, first impressions, yes or no? Do we, do we like Tyler's resume? What comes to mind as you, as you scan? Remember, we're scanning here because we only have five to seven seconds. A lot of great feedback so far. Um, a lot of people are saying no, no experience. Um, so let's, let's, um, Let's talk about some of the strengths before we, we break down the opportunity for, for Tyler. So some of the positives of this resume is that there are, are a few different font types in this resume that we will talk about in a minute, but the headers used for each section are in simple, readable language. And we always recommend that you select fonts and colors that are easy to read, okay? So the areas of opportunities. So many of you may have found, and I can see on the comment section, that you're finding that the colors are a little bit distracting. And I will definitely agree with you here. I think that there's nothing wrong with incorporating one or two font colors. Personally, in my resume, I go with black and blue. But I just find that the greens and the reds are a little bit distracting, OK? 
the photo, okay, um, depending on where you, are, where you are in the world, sometimes images or a headshot is required. In the United States, that's not so common. Often I, I find that people just um, link uh, folks to their LinkedIn profile if they're curious to see who the person is. I also think that there's um, too many font types, okay? Recommend maybe one or two fonts max and then one or two font or one or two colors max, but a combination of more than, than three just starts to get confusing. And, you know, quite frankly, even with the photo, I just don't think it's uh, quite professional here, okay? So let's move on to, to Jason. So let me know, what do we think? Uh, you know, Jason clearly has a lot of experience. What, what, what do we think about uh, Jason's resume here? Sabrina says, don't use cur cursive fonts. Um, that, and we're talking about uh, Tyler's here. John's first impression says busy with an exclamation point. Nick says, that's a lot of stuff. And I agree. So let's, let's move on and let's, let's talk about some of the strengths before we go in and make some recommendations. So um, always select a font type that is simple and easy to read. Um, so before, um, it's maybe not as common right now to print uh, resumes. So it used to be that uh, we used to recommend Times New Roman, right? Today, because most uh, fonts are digital, you may want to go with like an Arial, a, something a little bit more um, web friendly, okay? So I think font size in this case are, are, are really good. Um, now, areas of opportunity. So while Jason may have selected a legible font, the lack of white space makes the resume um, as a whole very difficult to read, right? So there's a lot to get through. And I think what may have happened here is Jason was trying to cram all of his information into one page um, instead of maybe extending it to two. But I also think that there's um, job descriptions or jobs here that are not related to, to the um, job role. And we're going to talk a little bit about when it's necessary to maybe um, not include some of our past experience, okay? Perfect. We're going quickly here because we want to get to the good stuff. We want to get to the um, to the best practices. So let's take a look at another resume here, okay? And again, let's let's take a few seconds. Let's digest this. Um, again, we are keeping. Um, we, we have our recruiter hat on right now. Remember, we've got 30 minutes to go through a stack of resumes. Some examples here. Excellent. All right. Good on white space. Sabrina says good on white space. Um, red doesn't seem like a good choice. Okay, good stuff. Adisha says, nice, but red color, really dis uh, disturbing, distracting. No sales experience. Uh, small margins. Okay. Two small texts. Good stuff. You guys are pros. I like this. So let's talk about some of the, the positives. So Liana's detailed summary at the top of her resume makes it easier to quickly review the most important details of her experience. So when you only have six to 10 seconds with an employer, I think a detailed summary can present the best information in the quickest and easiest way possible. You may also notice that the details around each of Liana's positions follow a specific pattern. So these bullet points start with a specific action verb and are followed by a measurable detail, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about measurable details in a minute. So let's talk about the resume opportunities. So you may have found that most distracting detail of this resume to be the font choice. It is distracting and difficult to read. Oftentimes you will hold different positions during your time at one company. So instead of showing these positions as separate jobs, you can actually combine them into one, um, one section. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, sometimes we get promoted within a role Okay, doesn't mean you have to create a whole different section. You can have a company section and then just include the various roles that you've had with that company under that section. Okay, 
Now, in terms of the red font, um, you know, depending on um, whether you're going to print this resume or have it be digital, I agree with some of you that the red may be a little bit distracting, um, especially because there's already a use of blue throughout the rest of the resume. So maybe it may be one too many colors in this particular instance. Okay. Uh, Steve says, I prefer more black and gray rather than any color. I agree with you, Steve. Uh, mine, again, is blue and black, but I, I don't see why a black and gray would be would be bad either because you're kind of combining some colors that are, you know, can, can complement each other. Okay. Excellent. All right. So let's look at Ibrahim's resume. So Let's uh, let's take a few seconds and observe this one, okay? I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of feedback because, um, you know, this one tends to be a little bit more creative. I'm a marketer, you know, um, and I got creative with some of my resumes in the past. I'm not going to lie, but let me know what you guys think for this particular resume. Okay. Alicia says picture, okay? I think that she likes beautiful, creative guy. Okay, good, good, good. Anything else? Pretty good resume. It is creative, okay? Web designer and the design is, uh, is presentable. Okay, good observations. Handwriting, like font, less readable. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about some of the strengths. So you, we saw an example of a photo resume a couple of slides back. Um, my, one of my comments was that the image or the photo in, this, in that particular case didn't really look too professional. I think with Ibrahim, he's done a really good job to include uh, a, a more professional photo. Again, in, in, in the United States, you know, photos aren't necessarily um, uh, required or sometimes not needed, but you know, if you were to include a photo, I think, you know, make sure that you were including a more professional like photo. OK, um, most of you commented on how uh, creative this resume was. And, and that is true. Um, so it makes sense because based on his resume, it looks like they have graphic design and web designer background. So they maybe want to make a first impression by showing that they're creative, that they understand design, composition. So. Um, I agree. I think it's 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 more creative than the ones that we've seen in the past. Okay, and I think they, um, they also did a really good job with the white spacing, or sorry, the spacing in this case. So good stuff. Let's look at some of the opportunities. So um, there are some typos. So if you do go read into this detail, there are some typos and errors that can be distracting. So while the resume is pretty to look at. You know, it may be a turn off for recruiters to to see that there are typos and that they didn't double check their work. OK, so um, you may have also noticed that they used a template and forgot to um, remove the filler text. OK, so when we get to talk about some of the templates that Google offers, OK, we're going to want to make sure that we proofread so that any of that filler text um, gets removed before we submit that resume. Okay. So again, always proofread your, your resumes. Um, I get super paranoid personally, and I always have two or three people proofread my resume before I submit. Okay. All right. So some things um, that let's, let's talk about some of the things that we, we just learned. Okay. So some things that detract from a good resume are if the resume is too sparse, or doesn't have enough information, okay? Or on the other side, it is too crowded or hard to understand. Um, we also learned that um, it can be distracting to have a variety of text and colors on our resume. And then also it can be distracting when there are typos, okay? When we forgot to proofread. So let's share some strategies for improving your resume, okay? One second here. So here's the examples that we saw, right? Okay. 
All right, so now let's take a look at um, some things that are going to help us improve our resume. So today we're going to focus on four key things you can do to strengthen your resume. Um, so one, we're going to help you choose a professional format. We're also going to talk about ways in which you can highlight your skills and accomplishments, use specific examples and measurable details, and finally, tailor your resume to fit the specific job description, okay? So let's start with choosing a professional format. So depending on the job you're applying for, you may want to create a more traditional resume or go for a more creative um, template depending on the field, okay? So we can go the traditional route or the creative route, okay? The main thing to remember is that your resume should be professional, well-organized, and easy to read. And here are some key attributes to employ when creating your resume. So one, be sure to include wide margins and a lot of white space. Use simple and readable language. Use clear headings and choose an appropriate font, okay? Now, you may be thinking, but I don't know how to do all that, okay? What if you don't have design skills, right? You may feel a little bit intimidated at this point by thinking like, well, how do I start? Where do I go for? Or what's the best way to go about creating a resume? So the good thing is these days, you don't need any design skills to create a professional resume. In this case, I'm gonna talk to you about a helpful resource that you can take advantage of through Google, um, specifically, through Google Docs, which offers free professional resume templates to get you started. So you're gonna find that these templates include a layout, fonts, and colors, which are already set for you within the template. Um, and they all contain the basic information that you're gonna need to get started with your resume. For example, most of these templates will include a section for your contact information, a place for your skills and experience, and education, as well as a section for your accomplishments or projects you've completed. So once you select a template, um, you can fully customize it as well. Um, I won't have time to actually walk you through all of these templates, but I do have a session that's gonna start at 1245 later today, where we are gonna take a deeper dive into these Google templates. So I invite you to join me for that session at 12.45, okay? So now that we've talked about the um, and addressed the style to use for your resume, let's talk about how you can highlight your skills and accomplishments. And notice that I said highlights, not a list, okay? So let's dive deeper into what I mean by that, okay? So your resume, should not be a comprehensive list of all the jobs you have ever had, or even a list of all the things you've been involved with, okay? So your goal is to showcase the skills and accomplishments you have and to make the employer wanna call you in for an interview. The goal of a resume is to convince them that you are a good fit for that job you're applying for. And in order to do so, hiring managers want to see what skills and accomplishments that are most relevant to the job you're applying for. So don't be afraid to eliminate jobs from your resume that are not relevant to the one you're applying for. Your work experience list does not need to be an exhaustive list. It needs to highlight the skills and accomplishments you have that are relevant to the job you're applying for, okay? On the other hand, if you've done other activities like part-time work or volunteer work, that are closely, closely related to the job you're applying for and you've used or developed skills that would also be helpful for the job, you wanna make sure you include them, okay? Now, one question that I get often um, in, this, in these sessions is what happens if you've had a gap, right, between jobs? And it may have happened, right? Mm -hmm. So you can include um, work history, volunteer work, and be able to fill in those gaps with, with some volunteer work, or even if you went back to school, for example, okay? If you're starting a new career and haven't worked 
um, in the field that you're applying for before. Okay, examine all of the past job experience you've had or life experience that you've had and make try to make the connections. And I'm going to show you some tips for how to do that a little bit later on. Danny, are we okay? We're a little over, and uh, so just wanted to give you a chance to kind of wrap up and maybe answer a couple questions before we move on. Okay, sounds good. That went by really quick. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay, great. So um, let's go on. Okay, so should we go on to the questions or? Um, Dan? Yeah, if you could wrap up and like maybe use this last minute to kind of wrap up and then we can move on to the questions. Great. Perfect. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, real quickly um, walk you through um, uh, some ways in which you can uh, wordsmith your resume. So a lot of people, for example, have experience with um, you know, other roles, right? So, and we want to, sometimes we, we, we face the challenge of how do we tie in these past roles with this current role. So real quickly, I'm going to show you how you can wordsmith, for example, if you are a waiter, a cashier, your volunteer work, right? So here's an example of how you can upsell, right? Sometimes we forget that or forget to extract information um, from these previous roles because sometimes we think we, I was just a waiter, right? Well, there's different things that you did do as a waiter, like you upsold people, you sold the menu, you made recommendations, you engage with people, customer service skills. So here's some just tips on word on word saving some of your past experience in case you find that challenging. Okay. So Danny, do you want to answer some questions? Um, are there any major yeah. questions? Uh, yeah, we can. So um, kind of pulling this up, we have quite a few questions that have come in. I think this session has been extremely valuable, not just for, you know, the average individual, I think even if you've had experience in the field, this session is really, really relevant towards um, number one, upskilling, maybe landing your first job in tech or getting a new hire job. Uh, I think this would be very really valuable. So one question that I, I have this question, but it's also been in the chat. What are your opinions on using a, a two column resume or a multi column resume as opposed to like a traditional layout? So here's the here's the thing, and one thing that I was going to mention is remember these days we're dealing with um, uh, artificial intelligence or uh, systems that are going to read our resume um, before it gets to the recruiter. Okay, so keep in mind that sometimes columns, when you do have two columns, um, the system may not be able to read the columns in that order. So I would actually maybe refrain from using too many columns. Two is two is fine, but um, remember that. Before it gets to a recruiter, sometimes it, they're going through machine learning, and that machine learning is actually scanning your resume, and they may be reading it left to right. So just keep mm -hmm. that in mind. That's actually one point that I bring up quite often. I'm not a huge fan of two columns, if I'm going to be honest, but when you submit it to certain platforms like Indeed, um, Indeed knows that the single column is more preferable, so it actually tries to convert your resume into a single column. So when exactly. it does that and you use a two-column um, setup, it's distorting all of that, and you're probably not an ending up any, any higher results for the things that you're trying to apply for. So that's just something to keep in mind. But I completely agree with your point, Israel. Yeah. Um, so when this is a really great question here. When you don't have much experience in the field, what are ways that you can help add relevant experience or make sure that you're showcasing yourself in perhaps in a better light? Yeah, so let me actually, while I answer that question, let me pull up a slide that I think is going to be helpful for um, for for these folks. So um, it's going to really depend on you know your past experience. But here, for example, I'm sharing on your screen uh, when someone had experience um, as a manager and a team lead. So sometimes you know we we need to get a little bit more creative and not be so matter of fact with what we've done, right? So for example. Um, you, it's all about, you know, um, extracting um, more information from those experiences. So if you manage the team, you know, you just didn't manage a team, you know, make sure that you're adding quantifiable information like I manage a team of six or manage a team of 10. Uh, recruiters want to be able to see not just that you're a manager, but like, what was the team like? What was the team size? Right. So to answer your question, Danny, um, so if you don't have the relevant experience, but maybe you have experience in like a volunteer role 
or maybe you know you presented in school. These are all skills that you can still list um, in your in your uh, resume. Completely agree. And even one added highlight that I would even say in here, where people say I don't have relevant experience. One thing that people lose sight of is they don't talk about their wins enough in a position. Right. It's not just where you should be talking about your job role, but the actual things that you've accomplished there. So even if you're, and I see this example being used a couple of times, they're a busboy in a restaurant or they're working as a cashier in a store. You don't necessarily have to say, well, I just rang up customers on a register. We know you did that, right? I'd be more shocked if you didn't use a register to ring up customers <laughs> as a cashier. Right, but right. you could talk about things kind of like what you highlighted. Like, did you upsell customers? Did you increase customer satisfaction? Did you reduce turnover in XYZ position? Talking about that is relevant experience, and you should be highlighting that. Yep, exactly. Showing numbers, Danny. Like, for example, on the on the example we have on their screen, right? This is a volunteer role, right? So it wasn't just serving meals, right? It was serving meals to over 200 shelter residents over the period of six months. So here, it shows that you dealt with multiple people, but then that you were also committed for those six months, right? So I think you're absolutely right. We need to be a little bit more... Um, Add a little bit more color to to our resume by adding those that those numbers or those figures um, and those through. wins. Love that. Question here is: Is it okay to have more than one page for a resume? I know for a long time it's been said one page max, or you're cutting your chances. Is that still the case? So here's the rule of thumb, right? So are you are you building out two pages because you have that much relevant information to the job you're applying for, or you're trying to showcase everything you're doing? So the question here is, if there's roles there that are not going to be relevant, like for example, I my resume only goes back 10 years, and in my and in my description, I say over 15 years, but I'm showing 10 years of relevant experience, even though I, I, I have more than that. So um, but I don't want to overwhelm the recruiter by including roles that are not going to be relevant to the one that I'm applying for. So the question is, are you including two pages because you have that much relevant information or you're just trying to showcase everything you've done? Completely agree. Um, okay. So then I guess one question that we can even kind of add on here is, if let's say you have not a ton of job experience, right, but you have a lot of volunteering experience and things like that would you suggest someone perhaps cutting some of the non-relevant jobs but adding more in that volunteer area absolutely yeah so for example like i waited tables and worked at grocery stores um uh when i was going through college and you better believe i did include that when i first graduated college because i needed to make my experience work even though i was applying for marketing roles right so through that i was put a wordsmith right the, the those roles to make it work so it was definitely a make it work moment now if you've been in the industry for you know five plus years you have relevant roles just make sure to include that and then start to slowly cut off any anything else that's no longer relevant i, I completely agree and one thing that i even say i've worked with a lot of people on their resumes and you don't need to include every single job right and I would highlight things that are very key to the role that you're applying for. So for example, if you have a ton of web development experiments and you only have one design job, but your yeah. goal is to get a design position, I would highlight that way more than on highlight that job that you had in 1999 showcasing X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. But the other tip, Daniel, that I want to mention is that because we are now uh, working with more recruiters that use machine learning, so one pro tip that I'll mention is when you are writing a resume for a role and you know, you're going through the job description, right? One thing that you may want to do is pull that copy and paste the list of experience, the way that they've written it. Okay. And cross reference it to how you've written it. And what I would recommend that you do is if, if there's experiences that you have that's listed on that resume that match yours, I would use their wording because that's going to help you stand out in the machine learning. Machine learning, by the way, these machines are scanning to find adjectives and descriptions that are based on the description. So a pro tip is to copy whatever was on that description and anything that's relevant, make sure that you include the exact wording so that way the machine can, can pick it up. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that was key. Um, so I guess one thing that I would say 
and I'm a very firm believer in this, is having your information in the easiest way for someone to access, right? What would be like some key things that you think, maybe even like the top two or three that you could suggest for someone like, if this is the bare minimum you're doing on your resume, these should be like the three things that you're looking at the most. So your summary page, right? So the summary at the top. So a quick read, two to three sentence max that is going to um, let the recruiter know in one paragraph, two to three sentences, um, what you've done. Okay. So mine, for example, will say something like, you know, um, marketing professional with 15 years in the SaaS space, right? So that is going to recap um, in two to three sentences what my experience is. So I think that's very relevant. Um, uh, your education may be relevant when you're just coming out um, uh, out of college. So, you know, that may be the only experience or exposure you have. So your education may be very um, prevalent at that point. Um, but I think the other thing, too, that people forget about is, as you said, Danny, earlier, is they forget to include in the section or, or, or add a section for your accomplishments. This is where you talk about certificates, awards you, re you receive, conferences that you've um, attended, certificates that you have. So I think it's important to include those as well. Completely agree. Uh, really good question here. How to deal with employment gaps? So I, in the past, or what we recommend is that you fill those spaces. So if you are going to take two to three months off or, you know, you've been laid off for two to three months, I would make sure that you take advantage of that time to either get a certificate to do some continuing education and then that you highlight that in those gaps. So you can say that within that three month period, you got certified that you took X amount of courses. So a great way to fill that gap is through education or volunteer work. You know, for a long time, it was suggested, um, and it probably is still suggested to some degree, to write a descriptive cover letter before your resume. Do you still think that applies in today's day and age? Are people actually reading that? Because I know, especially if you're customizing that cover letter for each role, that's a ton of time. Um, yeah. Are people really reading that? So I think it's going to depend on the employer. So there are some employers that, um, you know, do want the cover, that cover letter, right? And it's going to, I think, depends on the industries. I know, like, um, a lot of digital companies don't really require that. Um, and so it's really going to depend. So if, if, it, if they do ask for it, you know, I would maybe take the time to do it, right? Um, if there is the option to, because um, uh, sometimes it's like, um, it's your option if you want to include it. You know, uh, it, it really depends if, if, you know, like somebody who earlier who said that um, with the question with the one or two pages, in that case, maybe do a one page and then a one page cover letter. That could be a good, a good, um, you know, um, compromise. Absolutely. I, I would say in vast majority of situations, though, I personally wouldn't be making too many cover letters. Yeah. They, I mean, you're not seeing them um, often these days. I mean, it's, but there are some employers do request it. Um, I think it's just going to depend. In the job experience section, should I include a brief description of the company that I'm actually working at or a des brief description of the role? Or perhaps maybe a counter idea would be using a very common term for that role as opposed to maybe the term the company gives you for a position. Like instead of being, you know, uh, on-site developer, I'm a software developer, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so so I, if I understand the question correctly, is write a description of the job role or the – or so is it a description versus bullet points? Is that the question? So, no, out bes before the bullet points, would you include a description of what the company did or like what oh. your role was at the company? Like a, a brief summary. Has Israel frozen? Okay, I believe we may have Israel frozen here. Um, We'll give him a second to see if he comes back. So until he comes back, I will kind of, um, yeah, he froze. Okay, I was making sure it wasn't just me. Um, but uh, one thing that I'll say in response to that question, I don't think it's necessary 
to actually add a description of what the company did. But what I do think is necessary is to use a common term for the role. Many companies may have a unique way of um, titling that position. You should not necessarily worry about uh, titling that position. What you should worry about is the common term for it. Because if, for example, let's say they call everybody, um, you know, uh, sales funnel developers, right? That's not going to actually show up in any search terms. That's not going to come to common understanding. They may not know what your sales funnel is, but if you're a software developer using um, .NET, that would be more relevant to the role and what you're applying for as opposed to um, anything else. Uh, I do see this question come up several times. Should a resume be in PDF format or um, uh, .doc or .docx? Uh, for me, I'm under the understanding that it should be under PDF because that's universally seen and they can easily um, go through that uh, as opposed to, for example, DocX. You have to worry about if they're you know, formatting it correctly or viewing it correctly. Something may be changed in um, the converting of it for, by accident. I, I would stick with PDF, yes. Uh, Chris, always PDF. Chris is someone that I definitely respect in this space as well and is a hiring manager. So seeing her say that, it definitely pushes... Um, my thought on that. So with that being said, Israel did an amazing job. We're at time. So what I am going to do now is we have our movement break. So I will go ahead and um, make sure that uh, we have our movement break. And then after that, we're going to have the LinkedIn crash course with me. So making sure that we get all of our LinkedIn profiles looking perfect. All right. So I'll see you after the movement break. Hello, DevFest. My name is Laurel Wishman, and I'm a part of the health and performance team here at Google. I'm going to lead you through a 10-minute movement break. The goal of this break is not to break a sweat, but just to get the blood pumping and hopefully leave you feeling good and fight some fatigue for later on in your day. So if you're able to, I would love to enjoy and invite you to join me on your feet. Otherwise, you can totally do this seated. Maybe just scoot to the edge of your chair, create some space for yourself, and let's go ahead and get started. Go ahead and take the fingertips really wide, and then inhale, reach the arms up overhead. We can lift the gaze if that feels good. And then on the exhale, we're gonna open the arms to the left. Keep the hips pointed towards the front of the room. We're just creating a little rotation in the spine. Good, and then we'll inhale, take it back through center, and exhale, open it to the right. Good, inhale back through center. Exhale, open to the left. Same thing, except this time, maybe you can gaze at your left thumb. Good, inhale back through center and exhale to the right. Good, inhale. This time we're gonna exhale elbows down and back. So creating little goal, goal post arms. Good, sort of like your puffing your chest up towards the ceiling or the front of the room. And we'll inhale, lift the gaze, lift the chin, and draw the shoulders down and back. Good, and then on the exhale, we're gonna lift the arms and round through the shoulders, almost like you're reaching out in front of you. Maybe you can tap your chin to your chest. Good, and then inhale, lift again. Elbows come down, almost like you're trying to tap them behind you, chest lift. Good, exhale, round. Rounding everything, you can even tuck your tailbone under. Inhale one more time, lift the chest, lift the gaze. Good, and exhale, round. Take that spine to the back of the room. Good, well inhale, take it up, take the arms all the way back behind you. Interlace the fingers here, squeeze the shoulders together. Maybe lift the palms away from the back. Find a little stretch in the front of the shoulders. Option to take the ear side to side. I love this one. Good, and then we'll find just a little extra opening in the neck. By gazing forward, take your palms, keep them interlaced, and just hug the left side of your body here, almost like you're placing your palms in between your hip and your ribs. And then drop the chin to the chest, 
and slowly rotate right ear or left ear over left shoulder. Good. Maybe close the eyes here, start to feel into that right trap. Kind of letting gravity take over. Should feel a nice stretch here down the right side. We'll take one more breath. Exhale at the shoulders, release away from the ears, and then take the palms back towards the middle and over to the right, chin to chest. Right ear floats over the right shoulder. Good, and we'll pause here for a couple breaths. Option to check in with the legs here. If you're standing with me, making sure that you have a soft bend in the knees. Good, we'll take one more breath. Exhale as the shoulders fall away from the ears and then chin back to chest, palms go back behind you. Good, we'll reach the arms out to the sides and then take the feet out into more of a squat stance. <laughs> so creating kind of like a big X here if you have the space. And then we're gonna start by just rotating our arms side to side. So you're gonna rotate in opposition of one another, moving through the shoulders, doing your best to keep your hips squared towards the front. We took the feet a little wider, so hopefully it's a little bit easier. We're probably still shifting, but just doing your best, taking your thumbs in the opposition of one another. Good, after a couple Breaths here, your shoulders are starting to speak to you maybe. Good. Very nice, we'll go five, four, three, keep them lifted, two, and one. Good, release the arms down, release the upper body over the legs, just take a moment, let the head drop below the heart. You can bend the knees if you need to, maybe grab opposite elbows here. So a little squat with stance ragdoll. You can sway side to side or maybe just find some stillness. Shake your head yes, shake it no. Take a couple cleansing breaths here. Option here, we're gonna move through the spine a little bit more, is to heel toe your feet in so they're underneath your hips. So about two fist width distance apart. And then we'll take the left hand under the gaze, creating a triangle with your feet and your toes. Take a deep bend in the left knee. You can even float your fingertips off of the ground and then just inhale, reach your right hand high. Good. You can open your chest towards the ceiling or you might be on a diagonal somewhere along here. We'll just take a big breath here. If you feel good, you can wrap that top arm. Very nice. And exhale through center. Let's move through the other side. Take a big bend in the right knee. Start to lengthen through the left. Right fingertips float, creating that triangle on the left palm lifts. Big inhale breath here. Open the chest and exhale, release. Good, release the head, release the shoulders. Again, sway side to side if that feels good. Nice. From here, we're just gonna start to roll everything up. So one vertebrae at a time, starting from the tailbone. We'll take it up until the shoulders and the chin lifts. Beautiful, we're gonna bring it into just a quick little march for a moment. So nothing too crazy, just nice and slow. We've opened up some space in the shoulders, in the back, in the neck. So now we'll see if we can target the hips a little bit before we wrap this session up. So just creating some blood flow here in the legs with this march. You can pump your arms if you're seated. You're not standing with us, that's still gonna do a lot for you. I always like to tell people if you only have a few minutes in the day, one good rule of thumb is to squat, sit in a squat, do some squats, maybe some calf raises. And then the other thing is just to move, to increase your heart rate. Go for a quick walk or a jog or swim. Good, very nice. From here, we'll hug the right knee into the chest and then you're gonna take the right knee in your right hand, option to hold on to something if you need it, and you're gonna just create some circles here with your knee. So you can definitely use your arm to help guide those circles, or you can let it go. Maybe hang on to your desk or a wall and just find some big circles here. Good, switch directions. So whatever direction you started, go the opposite direction. Good, place that foot down and pick up the other leg. 
big tight squeeze. You'll feel kind of the front of your hip maybe tighten up here. Feels like a little pinching sensation sometimes. Good, and then same thing, create some circles here. You can let the arms go. You can hang on to something if you need it. Good, switch directions. Give me a few in the other way. Good, and then we're gonna find a little balance challenge. So option to join me for this, or you can do the same stretch seated if you're not into practicing your balance today. But you might have it, so maybe try, um, and just make sure you have something that you can catch yourself on if you stumble. So go ahead and lift the right knee up towards the chest. Um, flex the foot, so you should be able to see the bottom of your foot if there were a mirror in front of you. And we're just gonna take that ankle and place it on top of the thigh, opposite thigh. Just finding this little triangle here. From here, you might already start to feel a stretch from the outside of that hip. If you're cool here, you can stay or reach the arms forward and the hips back. Almost like you're trying to sit in a chair behind you. Chest stays tall, you can sit a little lower, and then you should really start to feel that stretch. If you're seated, you're just gonna take your ankle onto that top of that thigh, opposite thigh, and stretch here. You can lean forward if you want a little bit more. Good, we'll take one more breath here, and then take it up through center. Good, and release it, everything down. Good, let's switch sides. Take that knee up in line with your hip. Flex your foot, and then slowly we'll take the ankle on top of the thigh. We'll reach the arms forward as we sit the hips back, really reaching those hips back, finding a point to gaze at in front of the room will, can help if you're still playing with your balance here. And if you want a challenge, you can close your eyes, but make sure that you're not gonna topple over onto something. It's harder than it sounds. Good, we'll take one more breath here, maybe sit a little bit lower, find a little deeper stretch, and then we'll lift and release. Awesome work, shake it out. Great job, that's it. That's 10 minute stretch break. Hopefully that helps add a little bit of movement into your day, a little brain break um, from the event. And I hope everyone has a really great rest of the event and stay moving. Bye. All right, everybody, we are back and we are here now to talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is something that I talk about quite often. Um, I'm excited about LinkedIn mainly because it's a, such a powerful tool that if used correctly can open a lot of doors, it can bring a lot of opportunities, but most of all, it can help you in getting that next job in tech. So one thing that I'm going to do real fast, huh, let me bring over this. I opened up, a, I had a bunch of people submit their LinkedIn profiles. And what I'm going to do with that is with you live, we're going to review the good, the bad, the great. I haven't really looked through these um, profiles myself. So we're going to go through it in real time to kind of see what are things people are doing? What are ways that they can improve it? So on and so forth. So let me bring this menu here and we will share this. Stop sharing that. And now let me share this part of my screen. All right. And I'm paying attention to the chat as well. So make sure that, you know, if you have questions, if something is curious to you that you're unaware of, let me know and we can kind of address this. And I kind of see everybody already go, Danny, let's go. We're ready. That is awesome. All right. So this is kind of to give you an idea. This is my profile. So this is going to be kind of where we can see how we can utilize space and really bring um, certain things to aspect, right? So I'm going to let you in on the things that I look at when I look at a profile, but also what through countless and countless conversations that I've had with hiring managers and um, experiments that I've done and uh, recruiters actually showing me some of the tools that they utilize um, on a page on how they find candidates. Uh, this is kind of what we're looking at. So this is your landing area, right? So this is what people see when they click on your profile. And one of the things that I always say is you have to have a good header. Your header is, it's an image that you can utilize. And if you utilize it well, you're turning 
an area with, that is kind of known for dead space into an action item, right? It's a call to action onto something and it's instantly letting them know who you are. So for me, obviously most of these, all these photos are pre-pandemic, but these are things that I was doing in the community. So we did a uh, uh, Give Camp Memphis, which is an amazing um, initiative that we have here in Memphis, Tennessee, where one weekend every year, we kind of have all the developers around kind of donate their time. And we're just making websites for nonprofits for free to help them out. So for homeless shelters, um, uh, domestic violence centers, uh, you know, nonprofits that are doing good, we want to help empower them. So this first image here is from that, that that was the team that I was with. We were making a ton of websites. This is also from that event. This is from the community events that I did that I currently still do in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. This is me speaking at um, a, a talk, and it kind of highlights that Danny Thompson, developer, community leader, speaker, trying to help as many people as I can. That is just who I am, and it's kind of reflective of the things that I do. One thing that I often tell people to do, if you really want to utilize this area in a strong, strong way, you can go ahead and add um, your phone number here, a link to your portfolio site, your email address, basically a quick way for a hiring manager or a recruiter to contact you in your most preferred methods, okay? Now, I, I kind of see um, quite a few things already coming up here. Uh, should we use LinkedIn Premium? I'll be completely honest. If LinkedIn Premium is free, go for it. Outside of that, I don't see a reason to have LinkedIn Premium, if I'm being completely honest. Unless you're a recruiter or someone that's sending like 500 messages a day, I don't necessarily see a value in LinkedIn Premium in that respect, just being completely honest about it. But like every few months, they're like willing to give you like a free month. Take advantage of that free month. So the first thing that we need to really pay attention to after our header image is our tagline. So right here, you can kind of see the first part of your tagline should be the position that you are trying to be noticed for. That is the key here. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, oh, I'm a cashier. Oh, I'm, uh, I work at a, you know, a, a hair salon. That is what you're going to pop up in a search for. So if you're putting the position that you currently have in the title of you know, that spot, that's what you're going to be found for. Keep that in mind when you're putting your titles together. Because if you're not putting developer, right, you're never going to be found for that. Or the second part of that, oftentimes I have people that are trying to become developers put aspiring developer there. Here's the fact. No hiring manager in the history of the world ever woke up out of bed and is like, today's the day that I'm going to search for an aspiring developer, right? Today's the day I'm going to find that aspiring web developer. No, that is not the search term that they're using. So you're killing yourself by having that aspiring there in the beginning. Put down the actual term you want to be notified for. After that, utilize a pipe. You know, if you are used to JavaScript or anything, you're used to the logical or operator. So use that pipe to separate that and then start putting the stacks that you want to be known for. So kind of me, I put React and Go. But honestly, if you're completely new to tech, I would have React, Go lang separated so that way you're popping up for each individual one. But for me, I know more often than not, I'm being found for um, my stacks that I'm involved in. And of course, I, I, since I'm in DevRel, uh, I kind of put de developer relations there since that is the current thing that I'm already doing. I love this. Seems like I'm already finding things to fix on my profile. This is what I'm so focused on because people don't think about these things and they just kind of just leave it up and uh, definitely trying to fix that. Okay. So I, and I kind of put like, I talk about coding, programming, et cetera, mainly because I know a lot of people find my content um, to give you an idea, every single profile that you have, this isn't visible to everybody else. It's like, you're not going to see this on other profiles, but you'll have a dashboard here where you can kind of see the number of people that viewed your profile. I think it's like in every 30 days, this kind of uh, changes. So in the last 30 days or no, it's every week. Sorry. Every week, this is updated. So, um, uh, how many people viewed your profile for that week, but also your post views that will change based on whenever you make your post. So my last post has like 22,000 views, but this is the number that we really want to pay attention to. So in the last week I've appeared in 4,100 job searches of which like 20% of that ends up turning into um, actual people like reaching out to me. So can't tell you how many messages I get every single week of people saying, Hey, we have the perfect job for you. We have the perfect stack for you. And the reason why I bring this up is, there's only so much you can do by actively applying to jobs nonstop, right? Having a strong 
LinkedIn profile, it is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And this is something that I stress a lot. Having the right search terms, having your content laid out in a very quick and easy to read way is crucial at being noticed. Kind of, and this is a stat I've been using for a long time to tell people, and I'm so glad that uh, our previous speaker, Israel Serna, pointed this out. The average hiring manager spends six to 10 seconds on a resume or a LinkedIn profile before deciding that they're going to invest more time into that candidate. You need to have your information laid out in a very easy to read way. If you're hiding your information, if you're putting it in other areas, if you think that, well, I have it in this random spot on the profile that I haven't given a lot of attention to, they're just going to get that information. It's not going to be the case. We need to make sure it's laid out. And when you have the information easy to read and the search terms in a great way to be notified, your job searches are going to increase. I can't tell you, and if you haven't seen this already, I have the LinkedIn series on YouTube. It is completely for free. I don't want to monetize anybody's entry into tech. Check out that LinkedIn series. Um, I interview several hiring managers and recruiters, showcase what they actually look for in profiles. And I'll share that link also in um, the Slack channel if you're not in there. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen little screenshots from people where they've landed in zero job searches or 10 job searches in a week time to they make these changes and now they're at 500 job searches, 1,000 job searches, and they start getting those jobs in tech. Really focus on that. Now, the most important piece of real estate on your LinkedIn profile is your featured section. I scream this to people. Make your featured section something that is interesting and scrollable because you are now controlling the narrative of what they see about you. Like you choose what is in your featured section. So a hiring manager can see what you think is important, what you think they need to see, but also the goal should be increasing scrollability. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen people share a link to their GitHub or a link to their portfolio site, and there's missing images there. That's not going to entice me to want to scroll through this. But now I kind of see all these images here. I kind of see as I'm scrolling, there's a lot being shared here. Uh, my background, for those that don't know, uh, I come from frying chicken and gas stations for over 10 years of my life. Um, I learned how to code. It completely changed the trajectory of my career. I've worked at several software developer companies. Um, everything has changed. And now, of course, you know, working on the dev ecosystem team at Google, we're able to do amazing stuff when it comes to the field of technology. But all this gives you the reason to want to continue to scroll and hopefully press that see all button. And when you go to that see all, I'm still controlling the narrative of the conversation because now you're seeing how, for example, I spoke at a Microsoft conference. I spoke, I teach kids how to code, um, all this good stuff. That's what you want to happen. There, okay. Um, you're about me. Please do not make this an essay. One thing you need to understand, your focus for your profile should be quick, concise points. It's not your autobiography. You will give them the details of your autobiography in your interview. Don't do that here. Quick points that explain very quickly what it is that you did and what it is that they can figure out um, how to utilize that information. So about me, very short, concise to the point. One thing that I really want to emphasize here on your about me, don't have like a huge essay here. It has to be short. And don't have like a tagline of keywords. That's the way that search result is going to go. They're just going to see that um, keyword that they're looking for in a, in a line. They're not going to see how you worked it into the statement. They're just thinking you're tagging a bunch of keywords. Actually discuss how you utilize these technologies. So experienced leader, and don't say you're motivated. Everybody's motivated, right? Use actual things that you can demonstrate. So experienced leader with a demonstrated history of working in computer software industry, skilled in solving problems with HTML, CSS, et cetera, focused on being a valued member of any team. And I believe I'm rising to the occasion things like that. I run the largest meetup group of developers in the Memphis area. I haven't updated this since I got my current position. So due to my current position, I can't lead that group. So I need to update that. But um, as you can see, uh, going now down to my experience section. So kind of telling you, um, oh, there we go. I see all these comments of what's going on. So uh, one thing that I'll tell you is I work at the dev ecosystem team. 
for a lot of people, they don't know what that means, right? So I immediately follow that up with DevRel, which is a very common term that if you're working in the software industry, you know what developer relations is. Uh, we educate, we help, and we support the life cycle of um, the content that uh, we do. So kind of sharing that there, um, I've worked on the STEM, STEM board uh, member. I don't really want to highlight that too much, but then I come into uh, my last position, software engineer at Front Door. Um, then after that, teaching at a boot camp, um, chapter founder, et cetera, et cetera, kind of sharing all that good stuff there. So giving you an idea of what the profile can kind of look like. Now that we have an idea of what my profile looks like and some of the things that we are looking for, let's check out some of these other profiles. And I want to see, um, I see the chat right here. So for example, how, how do you add an image to a website to be featured in a link? So that's going to be adding uh, content in your meta tag. So you can make sure you can see what uh, people would see if they share your links and things like that. So um, I love that very inspired story. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so going through here, uh, so proud of you. Thank you. That's very kind. But uh, the featured section, would it be decent to post regarding personal project milestones or what is feature worthy? Yes. Uh, one thing that I often say even posting a case study. So for example, you can say, uh, this is the problem that I've approached. This is the way that I've gone about solving it. And by using this approach here, I am now able to produce XYZ result and then a link to that project. So you're giving them a reason to click on that project that you're discussing. And by having that link, they are now more interested in that project and they understand the reason why you did XYZ instead of just giving them a random project. All uh, right. Uh, any tips for college students when it comes to LinkedIn profile? Yes, all of this applies whether you're in college, whether you're in, um, in the industry or trying to get your first job. Please list out your job experience. And we're going to go through several things. And I'm going to give several examples. I, don't, I haven't looked at these profiles, but I guarantee you several of them are going to hit on a couple of the things that I want to uh, highlight. Uh, your LinkedIn is very much like your resume, correct. Um, you can add a little bit more than what you could with a resume because there isn't that like one page, two page, three page dynamic. You can kind of add whatever you think necessary. And plus with your post, you can kind of control how much information is being shared. Um, but yeah. So let's move on to this first person here. We have Ali Wajahat, uh, software developer for Canada Revenue Agency. So he has this hacker.ca. So I'm guessing that's probably either a program that he really likes or a program that he's with. Um, I'm a computer programmer, so we can kind of click on that and just to see real fast. Uh, I really like this. This is his uh, portfolio site. So uh, this is really smart. He kind of left his portfolio um, website right here. So it gives you a, a reason to want to click on that thing. Uh, I'm not going to review his portfolio site, but that's very cool. I'm not going to open his contact info, but you can kind of see here, even his featured section has an image of him. I'm thrilled to announce I uh, graduated from computer programming. Now I want to click on that to read more, right? But he could have some more things here where I can um, click on that thing. So now kind of highlighting something. So he's a software developer at the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, and he puts this agency name, I guess, which is also in French, which is the national language of Canada. But instead of having all this, he could have software developer, add a pipe, and then utilize the languages that he's using within that role. And by doing that, number one, I'm sure he'd pop up in more searches, but it would also showcase his tech stack and the things that he's um, doing. Uh, code we cut. I'm not sure what these are reference. Uh, this might be the university that he graduated from or something like that. Now going to his um, about section, nobody's reading this. 100% nobody's reading this. So totally needs to redo this. Uh, I, me being completely honest, even I'm not going to read that. All right. now Okay. Now we've come to our experience section. So he's a director at Code We Code. Uh, he's a software developer for almost two years. Uh, at Canada Revenue Agency and is still a current role, undergraduate student. But the what's the one, before I even answer this, what is the one thing that he's not doing in his experience section? Anyone go ahead and drop in the comments, what is he not doing in the experience section that he should be doing? And I'm going to uh, drink a little water. Don't I know sometimes people are like, don't take a water break. I, I just need a couple seconds, y'all. So one thing that he's not doing in his experience section, yes, look at all this. Look at all this. First off, nobody's reading all that. That is correct. But expanding, no details at all, Salo. 
We have no description of the job roles. Skills, explain a little bit. Love all these. Yes, these are. this is what I'm talking about. Yes, we have no substance. I don't know what you did in that role. I don't know what value you added. I don't even know what it is that you did that could be valuable to another company. Like you need to add more and don't just tell me the, the actual like basic job role. Like I know what a software developer does, right? Tell me the wins that you had within that role. Tell me what it is that you were able to do where you were able to add value, quantifiable achievements, but the wins. For example, uh, one win that I described is uh, in my past role, I was able to um, increase uh, our customer conversion rates by 7% from our abandoned cart. So abandoned cart means someone that's gonna make a purchase on the website, they decide I'm not doing this, they exit the website. We are able to then reach out to them and by 7% increase on the number of people that actually abandoned and came back and converted to actual customers. That's a quantifiable win. And to be honest, this isn't a huge, huge win in the grand scheme of things, but it doesn't matter if it's not huge, it's something that I can talk about that I would contributed to and the way you, package that topic, it can be huge. So highly recommend highlighting those wins and giving people something that they can understand more about what you contributed to and added value to in that position. So his education was there, license there, cool, cool, cool. So uh, recommendations, courses, which is fine. Um, but one thing that also I would highly recommend, if you haven't done this already, volunteer. So you see this volunteer experience is fantastic. One of the best things you can do is volunteer because guess what? That experience never expires. And that's something that you can do and talk about and contribute to. For example, if you're trying to get that first job in tech, volunteer at a meetup, Add volunteer at a nonprofit, make a website for a homeless shelter. Adding those uh, volunteer experiences, number one, it helps your local community, which is awesome, right? Number two, when you're volunteering at um, a nonprofit, guess what? Other people are, that are volunteering are people that are within the industry. That's a great way to network with individuals. But number three, when you're volunteering, you're also gaining valuable experience. What else can you do that is a win-win-win all across the board? There's no losses. So if you're trying to get some relevant experience, volunteer in ways that are meaningful and that add value to your community. So that is Ali's uh, profile right there. Uh, we have Daniel Azubin. I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Lagos. Um, so, yeah, so Daniel's definitely not doing a lot of things that we're kind of discussing. So his tagline, attended college, that's definitely um, not something that we want to highlight. That's not something we're going to pop up in searches for or anything like that. Um, the other thing is our header section here, it's the generic one from LinkedIn. So we're not doing anything with that at all. We do see that he's had an internship at HNG. Um, and he's going to this university. We need more substance here. You're not going to pop up in any job searches with this, right? And then going down, we have the internship with no description. We need more. Give me more, right? I know you were intern. Even if you're in an internship, you're doing something and adding value. You're leading an initiative. You're doing something. Talk about it. Don't just tell me you're an intern. Give me more because you were adding value. By not talking about it, you're devaluing yourself and you're devaluing yourself in the one area where you can control the narrative of what people are walking away with. Talk about that, right? And so everything else is just basic. They haven't added really anything to the profile. So there's not really much to review here, but we need to talk about more about what we're doing. And we're literally missing the most important piece of real estate on your profile, your featured section. So going from that, we have a Ronnie here. So Ronnie is open to network, a very, you know, kind of generic um, uh, background photo. We could definitely upgrade that, but I mean, it's still better than not having anything. Um, we have front-end developers. So here, right here, this is a search term that if somebody was going to land in, this is a great way to kind of make sure that you're visible for that, right? Um, so here we have JavaScript, CSS, HTML, React. So the one thing that I always say is um, if you're going for front-end developer uh, and you're going for, like, let's say, JavaScript and React, we can almost guarantee that HTML and CSS is not going to be something that is um, searched. It, it, kind of when it is, you're being searched for for a front-end role and they search React, they kind of almost assume that you know HTML, CSS, because with React, you're going to have JSX codes, which is, I mean, uh, it, it is very similar to HTML, 
um, and you're going to be inputting that code that way. So they assume that you already know that. Um, so here, the BS and all that in the uh, web coding bootcamp, I would not have this here. Um, I would have that in my education section. It should not be in your tagline. Um, we see that he graduated from St. Leo University, which is fantastic. The about section. This is what I was talking about when it came to um, leaving all your um, keywords in the section. So if I were to actually search this, and let's say I search Node developers, right? So I'm searching Node.js. This is how it actually looks um, in that search area. So it's going to highlight the word that I searched and it's going to show me everything in that sentence with it. So for me, from the perspective of a hiring manager or a recruiter, it's basically showing me, oh, they just added a bunch of keywords. Uh, I don't know how they utilize this technology. We need to showcase how we utilize this. The other thing is this about section, it's pretty big. I would really shorten this down to two to three sentences, four at the most. Activity, we're also missing the featured section, which is the most valuable piece of real estate that we can have on the profile. I would add some more posts and feature the things that we want to see. And yes, kind of see right here. So it all looks like a list of tags. You, this is where I'm really showing the difference. So do you prefer the term front-end developer or software engineer? Uh, number one, being completely honest, at least in America, those terms are kind of interchangeable. What matters most is the actual position that you're trying to be noticed for. So for example, a front-end developer would definitely be different in my opinion compared to like a full-stack developer where you're showcasing that you could use back-end technologies, front-end technologies. Um, Ronnie here has basically said, I'm, I'm looking for a front-end position. So I want to utilize my skills in React, uh, CSS, um, you know, create the front-facing, customer-facing portion of a website. So uh, he's made it very clear that that's what he's looking for and that what's, that is what he wants to be seen. So I think if that is the exact position that Ronnie's going for, he's done this completely correctly. Uh, all right, so insurance adjuster. So the only thing that um, we've kind of listed here, multitasking in the high volume environment, which is great. Uh, negotiate, this should be in bullet points. This shouldn't be like this. Negotiate with relevant partners. Um, he, Ronnie's done this for the last 18 years. So you're telling me, You've done something for 18 years, and these are the only things that you've ever done within that role? It's not the case. You've been in the position for 18 years. You've shown someone somewhere that you're great at your job. What was it? Was it the fact that you were able to upsell customers? Was it the fact that you were able to convert at higher volumes? You were, you were in a high volume environment. Talk more about that. Give me something. Give me something to actually say, Ronnie added value here. You're not doing that right now. Skilled in presentations. What does that have to do with insurance adjuster? We need more. Provide more. Talk about how you added value. This is what we're missing. You're valuable in this position if you had it for 18 years. You didn't have this job for 18 years because you showed up to work on time, right? You added value somewhere. What was it? That's what we want to cover here. All right. Um, and, uh, please, Corinna, if you can, I'm talking to you. Like, Let me know when I'm five minutes out. But uh, we need to go ahead and fix that here. Um, and of course, it's, it doesn't help, but it also doesn't hurt to have recommendations from some people that you've worked with. So if there are a couple of people on your team that you can kind of reach out to and say, hey, um, you know, can you recommend me for X, Y, Z that you know I've done within our team? That goes a little bit of ways as well. So Ronnie, hope this helps. Then we have Sharon here. Sharon, I just kind of glanced up here. Sharon's done quite a bit more with the profile, but we have something to use, utilize here. So full stack web developer, I would just condense this down to full stack developer. Um, we can have, so the technologies that Sharon wants to be known for is, are we five minutes out or are we over? We are, we are. I know you're dropping okay. a lot of gems here. So <laughs> let's just wrap yes, up. Yes, and yes, then... yes. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're wrapping up. Um, so we have uh, the technologies that Sharon wants to be known for. Um, we have the about section here. You can see this is just too much. So uh, definitely needs to be dropped down tr dramatically. The featured section, all of the, so this is kind of one thing that I said about scrollability. Every link that Sharon has shared is a link from GitHub, but none of these links give me the enticed feeling to want to keep scrolling through. We need something more substantial. Human beings eat with their eyes. Let's make them hungry a little bit. Give them something to say, I'm curious about this. I want to click on this. This is valuable. This will be great. Sharon, um, 10,000 followers. So Sharon's been doing great. One thing that I would say, especially if you're trying to get that first job in tech or that second job in tech, try to reach 500 
mutual connections. And I don't mean start spamming connections, but find 500 people within your local area that are in the air, the job that you're trying to get or the companies that you're trying to get, because those connections will start producing opportunities for you. But don't just spam. Networking isn't, what can you do for me? Networking is adding value to a conversation and making genuine, real relationships. This is key here. Add genuine value to the conversation that you're stepping into. So she spent time at we need more substance in these internships, but with these two internships that they have right here, I guarantee you this would add a lot of value to them potentially getting a role. So we're going to stop right there because we're definitely over time. I've enjoyed this tremendously and coming over here real fast. Um, should I put unrelated job experience on LinkedIn? You can, you absolutely can, but make sure if you're putting that experience there that it is adding value in some way. So, for example, if you've never worked in development and your goal is to, your goal is to get a job in tech, make sure that you're talking about the concise wins that you've had in there. But you don't need to be listing the last 15 jobs of your life, the last couple that you think will support you in what you're trying to do there. Um What's your take on LinkedIn articles? I think they're fantastic ways to add value to your profile. Put it in your featured section. I think it's fantastic. Um, I appreciate all these kind, kind words. One thing that I want to say, if, if you haven't already, check out the LinkedIn series. Um, I've helped over 700 people in the last nine, 20 months land their very first jobs in tech. I definitely want to keep increasing that number. I don't get a penny for this. For me, the one thing I always say is I, I expect everyone to pay me for the way that I've helped you. And the way that you pay me is volunteering at your local communities, helping out at your local meetups, helping out if someone has a question, be that resource for them and that way to help them get to that next level. Please add value back into the community. That is the only way that I get any kind of um, reward for doing this. It's you helping out local developers around you. We just want to keep uplifting people who reach that next level. Tech truly changed my life and I know it could do the same for others and you could be that catalyst once you get to where you're going. Don't pull your hand away. Keep that door open. You never know who you can help along the way. The true measure of someone's strength is the people that they pull up along the way. That is all I look for. So thank you so much for hanging out with me in this session. I've enjoyed this. And we are back with Israel Serna. Israel, welcome Danny, back. I feel like I ghosted you guys. I'm so sorry, but I'm back. Lesson learned. Oh, yeah. I'm going to stay on for a couple minutes and then I'm going to go off video if that's okay and then come back. So don't, yep. don't take it as me being rude. I just want to, you know, take advantage of this bandwidth while we have it. The comment section is going off. Danny, I'm so inspired by what you just had to share on your LinkedIn. I'm motivated to go back in and update my own LinkedIn profile. Thank so you. Thank you. Israel, the floor is yours. Yep, of course. So I'm going to turn off my camera just again, not trying to be rude, just trying to use up all my bandwidth. Um, welcome everybody back. Um, I'm going to be walking you through this presentation titled Power Your Job Search with Google Tools, brought to you by Grow with Google. We're going to cover five sections. Um, we're going to start off by talking about how to track your job search with Google Sheets, how to find opportunities with Google Search, how to create a resume with Google Docs, and then how to prepare and give strong interviews through Google Meet. So let's get started. We have about 25 minutes together, so I wanna make sure that I get through all of the um, topics today. So let's begin by how do, we, how do we track all of these jobs we're applying for? It could be overwhelming at points, right? When you start to apply to all these jobs and then you forget, right? Sometimes you're just applying and, and maybe you forgot to bookmark that page where you applied for. So the whole point of using Google Sheets is to help you track your jobs that you've applied for, okay? So um, if you're not familiar with Google Sheets, this is a free tool that Google offers. Um, it's very easy to access. You just need to um, create a Google account, okay? And what I do is with Google Sheets is I put together a list of um, all of the jobs that I've applied for. I create different column sections with categories like the job, the company, the salary, the website URL where I applied for. Because what you want to do is as you start to apply for all these jobs, you want to maybe assess and keep track of where you applied and then maybe which job is better than other jobs. Okay, so a quick tip here to help you keep organized is to use Google Sheets. And you can incorporate 
different tabs and different sections. Like for example, I have a whole different tab where I store all of my um, um, usernames for all of the different profiles, whether it's um, Indeed, whether it's through Glassdoor. Um, but here on your screen is you're seeing how I have a whole section for the job, a section for the company and the salary, right? I think that's important to track. Website URL and then any notes, right? Did I follow up? When was the last time I followed up? Um, you can even add another tab for your interview schedule. So if you got a call back, right, you may want to jot down the date, maybe the date for the follow-up interview. So again, Google Sheets is a great way for you to keep organized. It's super overwhelming. We understand to go through the interview process. And sometimes, like I said, you may be applying to different places. So let me talk to you now about how to use Google search to find different jobs, okay? So you many people start by maybe going to different job sites, okay? Um, maybe you're looking for jobs on LinkedIn, okay? So Google search allows you to look for jobs within your category, okay? So you can start a, a search by typing in jobs near me. You can maybe um, start by typing in part-time software jobs or software jobs in California. You can get very specific and even say software jobs in Los Angeles, okay? And what's going to happen is when you do that, Google is going to scan not just, you know, the, um, the, uh, all of the internet, but it's going to jo uh, scan job sites and it's going to include in um, um, jobs from different um, company websites. So the beauty of doing a job search through Google is that it's going to scan all of the internet. Okay, so as you, you're going to see shortly, that it's going to it's going to scan jobs from Career Builder, from Snag a Job. So you're going to be able to get a concentrated list of jobs pertaining to that job category that you just did. Okay, so. Let's walk you through a little bit more detail of the benefits of doing job searches um, through Google search. So like I mentioned, for one, you're gonna have a job search here. This is an engineer role, okay? I'm gonna point out a couple of things. So one, it's gonna give you the option of applying directly through all these different um, job board listings, okay? So let's just say that I have a glass door profile Okay, I'm going to want to maybe just go through Glassdoor. Sometimes you're going to see that companies allow you to apply directly from LinkedIn. So you're going to have direct access to all of the different ways in which you can apply for that job. You're also going to see the salary range as well as the job description. Okay, so again, Google is going to scan the internet and find all of the jobs that are relevant to this job search that you just did. Okay. In addition, you're gonna be able to access these filters, right? So you can filter by title, okay? Let's just say that I've been in a role, in a managerial role for the last 15 years, and you know what? I'm ready to go for that director role, okay? You can filter by titles. So if you're going after a director role, an entry-level role, a managerial role, you can filter by title. You can filter by location. You can also filter by date posted, okay? How frustrating is, is it when you're looking for a job and you find this job and you notice that it was posted three months ago? You may think to yourself, oh gosh, they may be well into the job search and you know I may be too late, okay? So you can, you can uh, filter by date. You can also filter by company type, okay? And then also employer. So let's say, for example, that I have my eyes set on um, a particular company like NASA, right? You can filter by NASA and see what jobs NASA is offering for that particular, for those particular roles. So again, these filters are going to allow you to take that job search one step further and filter out all of those roles that you are not interested in, okay? Now, one particular filter that's become very popular these, this last year is that you can now filter for jobs for work from home, 
Okay. So if that's something you're interested in, right? If you've if you're comfortable working from home and maybe you know you're used to it. So now Google offered this filter. So now you can actually um, look for jobs that have a work from home opportunity. Okay. So let's say you, you come across a job that, that you like, you can actually save that position. Okay. So maybe you can look at it later. Okay. Or come back to it. If that's the case, if you're using the, if you have a, a job tracker through Google sheets, like I showed you, you may, you know, go to the application and then maybe copy that link and bring it back to that Google sheet that we talked about earlier, or just save it for later. Okay. So this is one particular feature that I like to call out. So let's move on to creating um, a resume through Google Docs. And I covered a little bit about this earlier in my earlier presentation, but I'll repeat it again by saying that Google does offer free templates for creating a resume, okay? The beauty to these templates is that they are pre-built and include a lot of the relevant information that we should be including in our resume. So if you find yourself, like I said earlier in my earlier presentation, maybe feeling a little bit overwhelmed because you don't think you're a graphic designer or you're, you're maybe, you don't think you're that creative, you can actually go to um, these Google Docs, these templates and choose from a variety of templates, okay? And select one and again, you're gonna find that a lot of these are, have these sections, right? And you can always go in and edit these sections um, and, and uh, customize them with your information, okay? The other cool thing is that you can also, because this is a, um, a live document that's gonna live in your Google Drive, you'll be able to um, add and insert comments. So if you remember in my earlier presentation, I said to you, one tip that you may want to do is copy and paste the skills that that particular job description has. I would copy and paste that and add it here as a comment, just so that you can make sure that you're referencing that description. Okay, so instead of going back and forth between screens, you can copy and paste those notes into your resume and make sure that you are, you know, referencing that section directly from your resume. So again, inserting comments allows you to um, be able to, to add that. Um, so you can also, um, depending on a lot of people, and I do this for myself, I may create a variety of resumes for different jobs because maybe I wanna customize them a little bit. So you can create a variety of versions of your resume. So for example, you may, one of your resumes may be, um, you know, you mentioning your, uh, your need to want to maybe move up and be a director. Um, maybe you have a separate version for a particular industry. So you can copy and paste your resume and start to create different versions of your resume for the different roles that you're applying for. So it makes it very easy to, to copy and paste and not have to start from scratch. Okay. The other benefit to this is, remember, we talked about making sure that you're proofreading before you submit a resume. So work, uh, creating a resume through Google Docs allows you to share your resume with others. So if, um, if I was wanting Danny to make sure to give it a second pair of eyes or a second look, I can actually share the entire document with Danny and I can make him, give him an opportunity to uh, make him a, a commenter. So he can actually start adding comments to my resume and provide feedback. And this is super beneficial because these comments are going to go directly to your resume. And you can, you can see what Danny is saying directly on, on your doc. Okay. So again, there's lots of great ways for you to be able to also share your document. You can, um, you know, copy the link, you can paste the link into your Google sheets, just different ways for you to be able to get people to, um, help you out. So let's talk about preparing for your interview. So a couple of things. So full transparency is I actually got hired last year in the middle of the pandemic. And here's what I learned. And I'm going to share this with you because I think it's super important is that for one, remember that many of these companies hadn't hired remotely before. Okay. So a lot of these recruiters, a lot of these HR companies, a lot of these 
these managers and interviewers were doing this for the first time or are doing it for the first time. So remember that as soon as you're starting to feel a little bit nervous, just remember that this is new for everybody, okay? But what I want to point out is if you are interested in, um, you know, practicing your interview skills through um, a, a conferencing tool like Google Meet, you can actually um, use Google Meet to be able to maybe schedule some interviews. I know sometimes we don't have the, the, um, uh, the say in which tool to use, you know, but let's say you want to practice your interview skills, you can use Google Meet to be able to practice that, okay? So I wanted to call that out. And then when it comes to interviewing, so a couple of things that we've learned, and I, I think a couple of best practices is we have to remember that we're now needing to make an impression directly from our home, okay? Or wherever we're going to be conducting our interview. Some of us have the luxury of having a, maybe an extra room in our home or a corner in our home where it's quiet and we can, we can, be, um, we can conduct these interviews. But sometimes we don't have that luxury, right? Sometimes we, we have roommates or, or kids. The important thing with all of this is that you create an ambiance where you are well-lit, Okay, make sure, and we learned this lesson today with myself, you know, we can't control the internet, okay? But make sure that, you know, we're, we're speaking slowly because sometimes we don't know what the bandwidth is for the person on the other side. So take your time, you know? Make sure that you're, you're, you're over, um, in this case, you're taking your time with your words, okay? That you're paying attention to the lighting, okay? I actually have a ring light that's illuminating me right now, but I'm also facing a window, to make sure that I'm well lit. Um, I don't have my camera on, but you'll see that I'm actually in, 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 in the den of my home. But, you know, maybe, maybe you want to choose a virtual background, okay, that's neutral, okay? We still want to make sure we're dressing professionally, even though we're in the comfort of our, on our own home, and that we're practicing, okay? So take advantage of that Google Meet tool. Have a best friend or a colleague, you know, help you with, with that. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about that's super important, especially if you are going to be conducting your interview remotely, is that we're not going to get the benefit of having um, of our future employer looking at us and reading our energy in person, right? And sometimes, you know, a handshake can, can give that future employer, uh, show them that you're confident, that you have great energy right? We don't maybe have that luxury now that we're remotely. So we have some extra work to do now, okay? And that means that we need to bring energy to that interview, okay? Make it feel personable by remembering to smile, amplifying your energy. I think Danny, when he was presenting earlier today, did a fantastic job bringing that energy to his presentation, okay? So the other thing too is master your introduction, okay? If somebody's going to ask you, walk me through your resume, I don't want to see a surprise face, okay? I don't want you looking at me like I just asked you a foreign question. I mean, you're here for an interview. So make sure that your introduction, that you have it nailed down. That way you, you can start your, your resume off with a strong start. You know, make sure, I'm not saying memorize it, but feel comfortable with, with that introduction, okay? Also, Keep in mind those common motivational questions that you're going to be asked, okay? Some of these questions shouldn't be a surprise to you, which is, why are you looking? Why this role? Why the change? Why this company? Make sure you're prepared to answer those motivational questions that you know are going to be asked, okay? And then also be clear on your top five to seven relevant examples that are tailored to your role. This will help you understand the core requirements of the role but also show the employer that you're that you have those answers prepared. And then also do your market research, learn about the company, check the news, learn about their interviewees, okay? This can also help you if there's like maybe a couple of minutes before the interview. This is a good opportunity for you to take advantage of that um, extra time for you to answer a question about the company. They may be very impressed that you know the latest news on their company, okay? And then remember um, the way that you show up to these interviews does matter, okay? So I mentioned a couple of tools today. I'm going to quickly recap these, right? We talked about Google Sheets, okay? This is a great way for you to be able to keep track of all the jobs you're applying for, to keep notes, 
to um, include information about your upcoming interviews. We talked about Google search, right? About conducting searches directly on Google. We talked about Google Docs, right? Utilizing those Google templates that are going to help us not, you know, they're going to help us so that we don't have to start from scratch. Or maybe if you have an, a resume already, maybe you want to improve your template or, or maybe consider another template, you can use Google Docs for that. And then utilizing Google Meet to practice for those um, interviews, okay? Some next steps for you are, if you don't already have a Google account, just remember that these accounts are gonna give you access to not only Google Sheets, but also Google Docs and Google Meet, okay? I'll leave you with some additional resources and I'll make sure that I drop these in the Slack so that way you have them, okay? If we have some time, Danny, um, I'd be happy to, to maybe do a, a live job search for somebody in the audience. Um, what, do you, what, do, what do we think? Do we have time for that? Yeah, you still have about 20 minutes. Perfect. Okay, so why don't we do this? Let me go ahead and pull up my screen and let's, let's go to the comment section. I would love for somebody to drop in maybe a, a job that they're looking for and then we're going to conduct let me know the job you're looking for in the city that you are um, you're looking in. So can somebody in the audience volunteer? Let me know the job title and then the city that you're located in. And we'll do a um, we'll do a, a live a live demo of this. Okay, so all right, we've got a front end developer Munir um, in Canada. Okay, so where in Canada specifically, Munir? Can you let me know the city? So we're going to do front end developer jobs in, uh, since he was the first to go, we're going to go with, uh, let me know, uh, Munir, where in Canada? Give me some, okay, uh, Windsor, Ontario. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to do a quick search for Windsor, Ontario. I'm also, I'm curious to know how many of you guys already knew about this uh, job search on, on Google? Okay, so here we're seeing um, jobs near Windsor, Ontario. Again, you know, we can go and look at jobs that have been posted in the past 30 days. You know, these are fresh, right? And remember, employers are constantly adding jobs. So the other thing too that you can do is you can actually set um, an alert, okay? So you can actually let Google know, alert me anytime a job for a front developer role in Windsor, Ontario um, pops up. And so what's gonna happen is Google will send you either a daily, a weekly email where you can actually get alerts on these jobs, okay? So again, here on the location, okay, you can go, you can filter by miles, okay? You can also filter by requirements. So if I have more than three years experience, under three years experience, we can also filter by the, um, by the, uh, the employer type. Um, this is also, let me see if it's doing it. I may have too many filters, which is why it's not showing. But again, um, here in this particular case for this role, I can apply on trabajo.org. This particular one, I can apply on Glassdoor, okay? And you see here, down here, you'll also notice that this is another way where you can just, if I click on the jobs alert, I'm gonna start to get emails alerting me of jobs within, um, within this. So again, here's a look at all of the jobs that have appeared for front end developer in Windsor, Canada. Okay, let's look at somebody else. So, um, let's see, there's uh, somebody says uh, entry level, Entry level, um, I'm looking at, um, somebody said here, there was an entry level role here um, in Lagos. Okay, so entry level, um, front end developer jobs in Lagos, okay? So again, so this is gonna show all the jobs in the area. Okay, so this is uh, entry level. Um, again, you can do the date posted, the requirements. You can do a full time. For those of you that are looking for internships, you, it also picks up internships. 
okay? And then again, if you want to do an alert. So this is just another example of, of, of jobs. So you can see it, there's a nice list here for, of, of jobs that you, can, that you can start. Okay, um, let me also show you, since we're here, let me also show you on the resumes, since we have a little bit of time, let me just show you the templates because I think a lot of people, and I'm gonna share my screen momentarily. Give me one sec. One second. I'm gonna show you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. So from Google, keep in mind I have a Google account, okay? I'm gonna let my screen show up. Okay, here we go. So from my Google account, I'm going to go to Google Docs, okay? And then I'm going to go to here, blank. And then from File, under File, under New, I'm going to select from Template, okay? Now you're going to notice that there's a ton of different templates for different types of things, um, including legal documents, human resources. But we're going to go to Resumes. And you're going to notice here, there's a variety of templates. I'm gonna go ahead and just choose this Swiss one, okay? And what you're gonna notice is, again, this is how easy it is to customize. Now, again, if you're feeling intimidated by the process, this is how easy, this is how easy it is to, to customize. So remember, you've these pre-built templates have all of the sections that are very common, right? That you're, you're going to need. You can always edit and, and, and remove, but this is just a great way for you to get started. Um, again, for me, the biggest benefit is that I could um, obviously customize, right? But also, I love the idea of, you know, being able to, um, sorry, to add comments, okay? I can add a comment, um, if Danny were to be proofreading, Danny could actually add edits, and I can see Danny's edits here as well. So again, these are just some of the tools that Google has to offer. Are there any questions, Danny? Anything that I can help clarify? I think you're on mute, Danny. Oh, uh, yeah, or of maybe course. Me. Of course. There we go. I mean, it's 2021. <laughs> you think I'd know where the mute button is at this point. <laughs> Uh, if the job is offered on many sites, is there any benefit of using one site over another? Well, I would, you know, depends, right? So if I have a LinkedIn profile or if I have a Glassdoor profile, that's obviously going to be a preference. Um, you know, if, if you're finding that some of these um, sites are reoccurring, like a Glassdoor, like if you're finding that a lot of these roles are offered through Glassdoor, it may benefit you to create a Glassdoor um, account for that. Um, so we have this question here. Can we use bold text to highlight something on our resumes as opposed to simple text? Bold text as opposed to simple text. So maybe like bolding certain items that we want emphasis on. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I do that on mine, for example, like, um, and I wish I would have pulled up mine, but yeah, like I'm guessing like if, if this was like something you wanted, like you want to highlight the entry, you know, sentence. Sure. Why not? I think it's, it helps to maybe call it out. Some people do it, you know, they'll bold their company name, um, their job title. So it, it depends, but yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I wouldn't overdo it if it's not needed. Absolutely. And if anyone has any questions, now's the time to ask and I'll present them to Israel. I guess one question I have in regard to utilizing Google jobs and resumes, I know, you know, earlier we spoke about, for example, if we were to apply to a job through like Indeed, it may um, convert that resume over. If we were to apply through a position with like Google Jobs, would that same conversion happen if we submit our resume and as I say, multiple columns? So you wouldn't be able to apply through Google Jobs, right? Google's just going to give you the link of where to apply. So it's going to take you to the company site. It's going to take you to, because sometimes it may not be through Indeed. It may be, you know, sometimes the company wants you to apply directly with them. So it's going to give you the link of, of where. Now, because Google is scanning the entire internet, it's going to know that this job was posted in five different locations. And so it's really going to be up to you which one to go with. All right. And 
<clears throat> so we have this question here. I don't know if this is something that you'd be able to answer, but what do you do if all local jobs are requiring a minimum of two years of experience for entry level positions? So I know this is like, <laughs> it's a catch 22, right? It's a catch 22. So, I mean, it's going to depend, John, if you have any um, internships, right? So if, if you, let's say if you don't have any jobs earlier, you know, we talked a little bit about how to get creative with the jobs that we have had and how we can call them out. So it may also benefit you to maybe start an internship um, while you're, while you're applying, because that you can always list that as an active role. So, um, you know, it may not necessarily be that you've had it in the past. It may be that you're in it or you're looking to, to start a, um, an internship. Yeah. And being completely honest, one thing that I always say, I'd never look at the years unless they specify, like, I want a senior developer, then that's right. the only time, like, I stay back. But if you, if you match most of the requirements, apply. If yeah. you match 50%, if you know the main languages that they're looking for in the tech role, apply. Worst case scenario, they say no. You're literally in the same position you were before. Best case scenario, they say yes. Or yeah. at the very least, you now have an opportunity to have a conversation with them and show them how valuable you really are. It's true. Yeah, Danny, the, the job that I applied for last year was a, was a job um, out of Portland. And then when I, you know, I landed the first interview and it was the first question I asked was, you know, is it going to be... Um, um, a it's going to work against me if i'm not in portland and they said actually you know we've discussed it and we're actually a little bit more flexible than we thought so i, I you know i would never have applied <laughs> you know but I, I i entered and i said let's see what happens you know because i i had the experience mm -hmm. so one thing that i really like uh, about the tool that you showed where they can find um jobs using google would Boolean searches help, for example? Like if they, they were to do something like front-end developer and um, emphasis on, let's say, a technology of their choice, like uh, Angular or something along those lines? Yeah, because sometimes, um, you know, some of those things, and we're seeing that more and more, right, where employers are looking for, you know, for you to have an expertise with particular products or software. So you can also do do uh, one as well for skills, right, where you can say, you know, the, the job title plus the skills that you have and then it will pick that up. So are you sharing your screen now? Are you sharing it to show something? Yeah, I was just gonna pull up the site just so that we can, sure. um, so that, yeah, just so, as a refresher. Um, so one question I have is how could somebody um, utilize like a tool like this to find more relevant positions to them as opposed to all the, for example, if you do use a site, let's say, I don't want to name a name, but another average job website, oftentimes you could put in that search result and find related searches that may actually not be related, but it's what right. the algorithm thinks is related. Exactly. Well, what I like about this is the filters. Like personally, I go, I go full on out with the filters. I think the filters are a great way for you to remove all that noise. And you know what? Let's be honest. I mean, sometimes we know exactly what we're looking for and you don't want to be distracted or overwhelmed if you land on one of these other sites, the job alerts also really help. So when I see that email come through and it says that there's five relevant emails I can scan, like the jobs that Google is showing me, and then add them and save them so that way I can review them later. So I think the filtering in this case is a really good benefit because you can filter by title, you can filter by salary, you can filter by remote work. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they want those things, right? They want to, you know, maybe even like, for example, with the distance, right? You maybe you want jobs that are within 15 miles. You don't want to waste your time with anything more than that. So the filters in this particular case is why I think this tool is super helpful because the others, the others won't give you the, first of all, they're not going to condense the list into one section or into one list. And so that to me is a big benefit. So, I know we've covered resumes and I know we've covered um, utilizing certain Google tools to help you empower your search. What would be, I guess, like if we were to give somebody three actionable steps to take away from both of your talks, the resume one and this, what would be three things that you would advise them to do to really increase their odds of getting noticed by a potential hiring manager or employer in a more meaningful way, just using um, these uh, two tools that you've kind of listed out here? Well, I think uh, for one, understanding that, and, and, you've, and you mentioned this, right? Understanding that we're now dealing with, before we even get to recruiters, we're dealing with machines, right? And 
we have to come to understand that, you know, especially right now, a lot of HR uh, folks don't have the bandwidth to review all, all the resumes. So they are relying on, on machine learning. So my biggest tip for today would be that you, you, um, you copy over that job description that you copy the skills as they're listed on that job description and copy them over to your resume. Like I mentioned earlier with the Google docs, you can make copies of your resume with different, um, with, for the different roles you're applying for and customize them. It is a little bit of extra work on your time, but I promise you that if you, if you start to use their language, you're going to get callbacks or at least get in front of recruiters because you you're utilizing, it's almost kind of like you're using their own language to get in front of them. Okay. And so, there's nothing wrong with you cross-referencing your skills with what they're looking for and then just utilizing and incorporating their language. So that to me would probably be my biggest tip. Um, I think we can end with this final question here. And I think this is a really interesting one. How can you tell if a job position is coming from an actual employer versus some of these resume harvesting companies? Like they're just trying to get your information. Maybe wow. they just have an arbitrary job posting that they're just sharing out there. Um, are there some telltale signs to kind of pay attention hmm. to and help you avoid some of those? I don't know, Danny. Actually, I, I, it's the first time I'm being asked this. I mean, would you? do you have any tips on that? Because I don't know if I do. Yeah. Oftentimes, one thing that I always say is actually Google search the company name and like see, do they have a glass door? Do they have like oh. previous employees that have worked that are, like can talk about things that they've done? And oftentimes you find with that, like, those resume harvest ones, their presence is almost non-existent. Um, in regards to like previous employees um, or it, for example, if you do like search that name and the only thing popping out are like these third party recruiters, you can be like, ah, probably don't have software developers working there. So it, it's a good, usually a good tell um, onto some of the things that you can. That market find, research uh, that we talked about, Danny, earlier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And, and I'm I'm a very big believer you should be, especially if you want to work at a company, you should be researching them because especially if you get to the interview portion, that research is going to help you tenfold. It is. And to be honest, how are you even going to know if that's a place that you want to work? And that's a problem with a lot of beginners too. Like they're trying to get their first job. So they're like they're in that spray and pray mode instead of like mm -hmm. very laser focused on the path that they want to take. And mm -hmm. so when you spray and pray, you're going to end up getting anything. And I can't tell you how many times I've spoke with someone landing their very first job in tech. We're like, I'm so miserable at this place. Like they're just kind of burn you out, turn you, throw you to the side. You don't want to be in that environment. You want to be in an yeah. environment that prioritizes you in that process. Yep, exactly. Good tip. Israel, I think this is incredible. Number one, you've dropped so much knowledge today. It's been <laughs> amazing. Um, I've taken a bunch of notes when it came to resumes, as well as different tools that I can utilize. And I think you've added a ton of value to this event. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank and you, I know Danny, business, for having so me. Thank you for even being no, here. No, no, no. I'll be on the Slack. If anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to connect there. Absolutely. Thank you, Israel. Have a great day. All right. One. Thank you, everybody. Good luck. All right, y'all. We are in the final stretch. Before we move on to our final session that we have coming up, we have three hiring managers joining us to answer a lot of questions. Um, and this is going to be your time to really get like the specific details for a lot of the sessions that we've kind of led up to this, the resume talks, the job search talks, the hiring manager point, points of views. Like this is all the culmination of what's coming on now. But before we get into that, we're going to get into these two raffles. So two raffles that we're giving away. One is a swag bundle. The other one is a Nest Hub Max. All right, let's see who's the first winner. We got Giselle, Giselle Sta Marie, I believe it said. Uh, Giselle will be contacting you by email um, to make sure that you know that you've won, whether you're here or not. Um, the only thing that you had to do to enter these raffles was register for the event. So as long as you're registered, your name is in there and hopefully lands on somebody. Let's see who the next winner is for the Nest Hub Max.
All right, Shannis. Shannis, congratulations on winning that Nest Hub Max. We'll be contacting you by email to let you know that you've won. So congratulations to all the winners over the last two days. We've given out a ton of prizes, ton of swag. Um, really, really happy to be able to share that. And now we're getting into one of my favorite sessions. I've literally had conversations with all three of these human beings beyond incredible. So I know you're going to absolutely love this next session. The next session is with uh, Dele De mm. Denise Carolina Vendetta. She's the engineering manager at Asana. We have Nancy Chaco, software test specialist from Dell Boomi. And we have Taylor Dessen, senior recruiter for Vaco. And honestly, I'm really, really looking forward to this. What's going on, everybody? Hey, Danny. How you doing? I am What's doing. Up? Hello, hello. Thank you all for being here. Uh, number one, I guess let's do your own introductions. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Let's start with you, Denise. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I am Denise Carolina, uh, and I am an engineering manager at Asana in product engineering, actually. And uh, I'm a hiring manager for my team. So I, as an individual, I hire for my team directly, but I also interview for different roles uh, for in other, other engineering managers, other engineers, and as well as tech leads. Absolutely. And one thing that I'm going to say to the speakers is uh, we are getting a little bit of background noise. So um, maybe uh, when not speaking, we could just mute ourselves in between um, moments. Uh, Taylor, what about you? Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, so the background music is probably for me. I'm in Mexico currently on my five-year wedding anniversary, <laughs> but I would not miss this chance to hang out with uh, Danny and this crew. Uh, but my name is Taylor Dessen, and uh, I'm a senior recruiter advocate at Vaco which basically means I try to help people across the country, specifically engineers. Um, my, my last tally is I've met over 5,000 engineers at this point in my career. And uh, yeah, so just try to help anybody out I possibly can and thus me being here. So very excited about this. Love that. Thank you so much for t making the time. Sincerely, I mean that. Um, Nancy, what about you? Yeah, I'm Nancy Chaco. I'm a software engineer in test at now it's just Boomi. Dell actually sold us off just a few weeks back at this point. So uh, we are an independent company at this point. Um, I'm not currently a hiring manager. I have been at many points in my career um, along the way, but I do actively help with interviewing for positions. Uh, and also recently, we've just created an apprenticeship program within our engineering department. And I helped to do a lot of both the program creation as well as hiring process there to get in uh, folks who aren't coming from a college background um, to be able to get an engineering career. Love that. So we're, we're going to be covering a, a wide variety of topics today when it comes to the interview process. And so before this session, we've covered kind of what people need to be doing on the resume and what people need to be doing in the job search portion, the LinkedIn profiles. So let's say they've made it to the interview, right? Like they're being interviewed. What are some things a candidate should be paying attention to or doing to have a strong start? And can we approach this question from the phone screening portion and then also approaching it from the actual hiring manager, face-to-face, um, -face phone call kind of situation? Um, we can start with you, Denise. Sure. Um, I think there are a few things that are a good starter. Uh, like, and pretty much it's just doing your homework, right? You need to research the company. You need to make sure that you research the person who you're going to be talking to. Make sure that you know who the person is and be prepared. Set the stage. And um, nowadays, this may seem like really silly, but even virtual or in person, make sure that you're dressing up. You're going to an interview. You're, you can change your PJs and make sure you can get ready. Practice in the mirror. Make sure your audio, your video, everything is working. You want to cause a good impression. So you want to make sure that they know that you're ready for the interview. And then if you know someone uh, from the company, maybe it's a good idea to have a quick chat. Uh, talk to them ahead of time, understand, maybe they know the interviewer, understand the company. Do you have specific questions you can ask uh, from those conversations? So that will show that you have an interest. And this is not just one more company that you're calling or getting a recruiter call uh, or a hiring manager. So it's good to have, I, in my personal experience, I do remember candidates when they ask me something about me or about my team or about the company I'm working on that is more specific. So I know they are interested and then that we can start building that relationship, which is gonna, it's gonna last a quite a bit uh, between you do all the rounds and all the back and forth. So better to start with the, with the right uh, impression. Love that. Taylor, what about you? What is something that they can do to have a strong start? So Danny, you and I are in the same vein with this enthusiasm. I think I think 
think that is an incredibly underrated part of the interview process. Listen, you need to research the company. You need to come with questions. But daggum, if you don't come with some energy, some heat, and you don't, uh, I guess, really just bring your full self to the interview process, that is not really going to separate you from a lot of individuals. Right now, there is so much competitiveness um, in the market right now. You have to be different and be unique and be yourself. I get a lot of kickbacks saying, listen, don't be yourself. We don't need that much. Listen, the company that accepts you for who you are, I'm a floral shirt wearing dude. Vaco loves it. That's the type of company you need to be with. So be yourself unauthentically or authentically. <laughs> Love that. Nancy, what about you? So I'll plus one everything that Denise and Taylor just said. Absolutely. Um, the one piece I'll add on top of that is know what you want also when you walk into that call, right? Know what you're looking for. Because um, I caught the end of uh, Danny and Israel's conversation right before this. And that was one of the points, right? That spray and pray, the like, just I'll take anything out there. I get that sometimes that's the move when you really just need that job, right? But if you're walking in also knowing this is what I'm looking to get out of this potential employment opportunity. Um, I think that that can make a big difference. One of the other pieces, when Denise and I were talking, you know, before this, she had mentioned like that candidate who uh, finds you on LinkedIn ahead of time and knows a little bit about you. Like that one always sticks with me when someone's like, oh yeah, I saw that about you. That sticks with me a little bit. So I, I think that that can be a good move. We have a really interesting question here in the chat that I kind of want to bring into here, right? And um, I think this could be interesting because I do – well, I'll ask a question first. If you need a couple minutes or let's say moments to think of an answer, what is the best way to communicate that and fill the time until you can compose your thoughts? Interviewing can be nervous for a lot of people. How should they handle that? Uh, anybody want to take this? I can take it. I think you need to be honest. Honesty comes first. So if you are not sure, if you don't have an example right away, if you don't have the answer, just take a minute and say it. Let me think about it for a moment. I need to make sure I bring the right example. It, it is totally fine to do that than having and just guess or try to come up with something that is not true. Because then that's going to come and fall later on you. So just like take the time and say like, hey, can I have 30 seconds? I'm going to think about it. It is likely the hiring manager is going to tell Please take your time rather than coming up with whatever <laughs> crossed your mind that is not relevant at all. Yeah, I, I do like something down here about taking having a water bottle or something close by. I also think, too, like if it's a conversation, like there's nothing wrong with pauses. Right. I mean, I, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into the in-depth like I've been through counseling and try not to react so quickly and letting things sit. But I, I think it's I think I think the, the art of pausing is something that we don't do as a society. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with you going. Uh, give me a quick second. Right. Maybe make a joke. I'm incredibly self-deprecating. So I'd probably make a joke. Um, take a drink of water open up a notebook, try to write down something. But I think, again, if you want to be with a company that respects you for who you are, you need to be yourself. And if it's like, hey, I don't know this question. Can you give me like a 60 seconds to figure it out? Listen, it may be nerve wracking to silence. But I would argue that sometimes if you're an interview, be more comfortable with the silence than anything else. Yeah, I was actually just thinking when this has happened, when I've been the interviewer in a situation, and I never have an issue with somebody saying, I just need a moment, right? Like, that's never been a problem for me. So I agree with that. Be honest and be yourself, right? If you need the second, just just let them know. Yeah, one thing that I've often done myself is I, I won't respond. And I think one thing that a lot of people, when they're interviewing, they think they need to fill every single second with a sound. And what I've kind of seen in my a lot of my experiences, for example, if Denise were to ask me a question, if I make any sound, that means I'm starting to reply to that. But if I just take a second and just kind of shake my head thinking, if I take 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, I haven't committed to a sound yet, so that means I haven't started my reply. But if I immediately go, uh, mm, uh, now she's waiting for me to add value into what I'm trying to bring to the table. If I just take that couple seconds to pause, the conversation hasn't picked back up, she'll be more comfortable with me taking that 20, 30 seconds before having to reply. That's something that I think people don't think about a lot. They're always like, 
every second must be filled with sound. And it's actually the opposite of that. Make sure your sounds add value. So if you're using them, it should serve a purpose. All right. Um, so I guess that kind of kind of comes into this. What is the best way for a candidate to send out an interview? Actionable steps. Like what can they say that makes this a very like memorable moments for them within that interview time frame? Uh, let's start backwards this time. Nancy, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to take that pause actually for just a second there. Um, I mean, ways to stand out for me um, is is some of what Taylor said before, that enthusiasm and to some level that confidence. Um, and oftentimes it can also be admitting when you don't know something in an interview. So if that question comes up where you're like, I have no bloody clue what they're asking, right? I want the candidate to say that to me, say, can you help me clarify? I don't think I've heard that term before, whatever it happens to be. Because if you're just going to pretend you know everything when you don't actually know everything, that's going to be a problem for me if you get on the job, right? Like if I hire you and now you're just going to never ask me a question and, and assume you know what's going on, that's going to be a disaster of an employment experience. So I want to know you're excited and I want to know that you're willing to learn and acknowledge when you don't know enough. Um, and, and for like entry level career switchers, those are the things that I'm going to care about quite a bit. Taylor, what about you? Yeah. So mine is on the follow up side. Um, I, I think we've kind of said some summer things like be enthusiastic, ask questions, all that. Know your interviewer, which I think is huge. But I think follow up, right? As a recruiter, as an engineer and recruiter, I deal with a lot of people at one time. The individuals who are at the top of my mind are the ones that follow up consistently. Now, that's not necessarily the answer on during the interview, but I would argue what happens after the interview could essentially catapult you to the top because of your follow up, because of your, maybe a thank you note you send through LinkedIn. Those are incredibly important things after the interview that sometimes get over overlooked. So my, my thing is follow up after the interview. Love that. Denise, what about you? I'm going to take it from a different approach. And I think someone that stands out for me is someone that has a clear story. So I don't know if you heard the term elevator pitch. So having a clear elevator pitch, 10, 15, 30 seconds, whatever that is, make sure that you have your story. It's, it's your story. You own your story. Make sure that you have a clear story about who you are, how did you get here, and what you're looking for. Practice with your friend, with your roommate, with your family, with someone. Make sure that you always know it and you can always come with a clear answer of, tell me about yourself. So that intro 15 minutes, uh, 15 seconds to 30 seconds, if you have a clear understanding of this is my pitch, I'm going to sell you who I am, then I'm going to remember you. Um, so that's something that I, I, I like to see from candidates. I can't tell you how much I agree with that. And a strong elevator pitch, especially if you give it near the beginning portion of that interview, can dictate the next 30, 45 minutes of that conversation. Having a strong beginning to the interview, and it, for example, translates a lot of the things that I'm going for. So using the example, if I'm interviewing with Denise again, and if I give her immediately into the interview, this is what I'm about. This is where my focus has been for like the last year of my life. And this is what I'm trying and aiming to do. Denise knows exactly where I'm coming from and can possibly tailor many of her follow-up questions around that. And the other thing is your goal should be able to create a very organic conversation. So if I give Denise enough to go off of, we can have a conversation. But if she's still trying to pry information out of me to figure out what do you know? What have you done? What are you trying to do? It makes her job a lot harder. Give her an easier job on the front end to make those deciding decisions onto where she needs to direct that conversation to find out where your strengths are. Absolutely love that. We had a really interesting question come in that I want to ask. Um, why are there behavioral questions in interviews? Behavioral questions always make me nervous. How can I overcome this, especially if English is not my native language? Anybody want to take this? So I'll speak a little bit, especially to the how do I overcome this portion. Um, one of the things is there's only so many uh, flavors of behavioral questions out there. I think, you know, there's the like, you know, talk to me about a time you've had a conflict with a teammate, you know, talk to me about a leadership role, things along those lines. Um, I think 
if you look back on your own life, your own experiences, whatever has come before this interview that you're walking in, you're going to find moments that you can take and twist to fit almost any one of those, right? And if you do that prep ahead of time, if you think about, okay, they're going to ask me about conflict. Let me find a point in my life where this occurred that I can speak to confidently, that I can, you know, spin or twist into whatever direction I want. You're going to then be able to be prepared to answer that question in whatever form they bring it to you, right? They're going to ask it in a slightly different way every time. But the reality is you can twist that to the story that you've got now really solid in your head. Um, So the, the how to overcome it to me, it's practice, right? It's, it's prepping those, those, you know, three or four or five stories ahead of time, and then feeling confident when they ask and being able to to go at it. Um, I will say uh, for English as a second language there, own, you know, be yourself, be you. As Taylor has said many times, if the company is not going to be willing to accept that and be able to work with that, like, that is not the company. That's not the company I want to work for, right? Like, that's not the company I don't think anyone wants to work for at that point. I'm going to add. uh, Oh, go ahead, Taylor. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Denise, please. Um, I'm going to add something that Nancy said, which I totally agree, which is on the practice side, have a script. I learned this a few years ago and I have a script for every single interview or every um, engagement that I have with someone that I need to practice. I have a timeline of my journey and then I have a script. So I know there are these type of questions. If they ask me about a time where I had this, I have it. A time where I did this, I have it. So it's easier for me to reference and then know you can have a printed paper, whatever form it works for you. But having it, that it will be really helpful. And then the second language, that's my case. Uh, Spanish is my first language. And I I know I recognize and I'm, I know I have an accent and I know that's me. I just try my best effort to make sure that they can understand. And if they don't, I ask, hey, are you following all alone? I know this is not my first language. Please ask me any question if you have one, but be real. Um, I'm going to combine a little bit of what Nate said, a little bit of what Denise said. Um, I'm really big on journaling after an interview. So I, I talk to so many engineers and they're like, like I really try to problem solve for engineers on the interviewing side because I hear it constantly, right? Danny, you and I share a lot of the same individuals in regards to, you know, finding resources. And, and I keep hearing the same thing. It's like, man, like there needs to be some sort of cheat sheet. And I'm, you can go out and probably buy some, I don't know, content creators cheat sheet. But my thing is, is like, why don't you just take a moleskin, just a journal and just write everything down about your interview, right? Interview with Google first round phone call what went well i did this 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 well what went poor i missed this behavioral question when it asked about a, this tough time so then what you do is your next interview step or your next interview you open that book up and you study it and then it jogs your memory and then you keep journaling you keep documenting and then you interview for a month holy cow can you imagine the goodies in that notebook it would be huge 100% Hundred percent, and I think this also goes to a testament into what I find with a lot of people is they don't think about what people are going to be asking them. So when the behavioral one comes, they're like completely taken off guard. I try to always enter into most conversations knowing what the other person may ask me about, so I have something kind of prepared there. Um, if I'm going to be completely winging it, I may not have um, the right mindset walking into that. So definitely agree there. Um, what is the best way? Oh, no, no, sorry. If you could sum up how someone can get hired into like three actionable steps, what would those steps be? On what side? The hiring manager side? Like a hiring manager critique or the job seeker side? Job seeker side. Like obviously we're doing this for like people trying to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to? Go ahead. Yeah, I can, I can probably get started with some things that we've already uh, mentioned before. Have clear questions. Uh, don't ask, like, don't ask just for the sake of asking a question. Make sure that you're prepared. There are multiple videos out there that you can look at what is a good question. Just come up with something that is unique to the position, unique to the hiring manager, unique to the company. Uh, then make sure that you have a clear motivation. A lot of time they're going to ask you, what are you looking for? What motivates you? What demotivates you? Make sure you understand what you're looking for. You don't want to get to like, eh, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to get a job. You just want to make sure like, I want to be a front-end developer. 
And then in my next three years, I'm going to become a manager. Like whatever you know is clear that you believe it and that you can demonstrate it, make sure that you state that. Um, and maybe the last one is just a rep a repetitive, but it's practice. You may want to just start by understanding uh, with the recruiting, getting a first recruiting call and ask, what is this interview look, look like? What do I need to know? Is it technical? Is it behavioral? Do I need to code? Do I need to prepare a presentation? What is said that I need to do so I can actually prepare and be ready. And it is totally okay to tell your recruiter or the first call you have, engagement call you have with the company and say, I need a couple of weeks to prepare. I need a month to prepare. I'm not ready. Uh, so make sure that you take the time, but you're clear of what you're looking for. One of the points Denise made, I, I really want to echo because I've like a thousand percent agree is like find that unique point to call out about why do you want this job in particular right um i will almost always at the end of an interview ask you know what is it that you know caused you made you want to apply for this position and when i get answers that are an answer you could have given any company out there right to me it it doesn't give me uh give me the feeling that you're actually motivated to be here um, and I really want someone who's going to be motivated to be here um, at this point in time. So doing that research, doing that prep ahead of time, understanding the people, the way they work, the, you know, whatever it is you can find about a company and finding the thing that aligns with you, I think that's a very key selling point. I, I think that's one that really can come across. Uh, Denise and Nancy crushed it with the one, two, three. I'm going to give a number four because that's who I am. Network. Right. If we're talking about how to find a job in three separate way in three unique ways during the interview, that I, that's yes, all of that. But I think you can study on how to be the best interviewer in the entire world. By the end of the day, if if you piss people off and you don't make friends and you're not kind and you don't network in the community and you don't give back and you don't help others. Forget blockchain, forget Web3, forget nfts forget all of that it's all about social currency and that's the step for 3b um on really how to um elevate your job search well that actually leads into like this next question i was going to bring up and i was hoping to answer this slightly. when i saw this come through how important is having a strong online presence do you think this weighs a lot in finding opportunities i mean i'm insanely passionate about this. I mean, I, I, I model, um, I'm basically Danny was one of my kickstarters for me and, and putting out content. So Danny, I mean, you're an inspiration to a lot of people. Um, but I would also tell you this, I've challenged so many people to do it themselves as a job seeker and they have found jobs because of it. And so I think, I think I'm not going to get into the meta, I mean, the metaverse and content and where we're going, because that's just, that's a whole nother thing for another day. But I think at the end of the day, if you're not putting things out on the internet, you're going, some people say you're dead. Some people say you're going to fall behind. Listen, my brother has a great career. He's a senior product owner at Eventbrite. He's doing great, right? And he has zero online presence. But if you're passionate about it and want to continue to give back and meet people, that's the way to go. I'll bring maybe the slightly contrary point is potentially the old one in the group here. Um, I have a crap online presence. Like that's real. Danny, you know, like I did my first Twitter, whatever the hell that was with you a little while ago. And I was like, I have never tweeted before. Welcome to the world. Um, what I do like though, is I like the uh, social media as a way to find people. From there, I want to make that connection one on one. I want to make a personal connection. You know, through the conversation I had, um, you know, on Danny's space before, I now have like seven or eight people who are looking to get their first tech job that I have regular conversations with. That to me is the power of social media that I like. When I'm looking to hire someone, I am not going out and looking what their online presence is, but that's just me. I don't know that that's everybody out there by any means. I think it's probably a mixed bag, but. I don't think I'm dead or quite irrelevant yet, so I'm hoping that you don't have to have a full presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Around. No. <laughs> no, no worries, Taylor. No, no. One thing I'm gonna add, I'm I don't also I don't I'm not the best at social presence in in uh, social media, but I w one thing that I would say is that if you do it because you want to be uh, in social media, make sure you're consistent. 
Uh, so make sure that for instance, LinkedIn is a perfect example. That's the one that I'm a little bit more active on out of everything else because I just don't. Um, make sure that it is current, the information. When you're looking at someone's resume and you want to check on their LinkedIn profile to see if they have any activity posts or anything, and the latest job is not the same as you have in your, in your hand with the resume, you don't understand what's going on. So make sure that if you're going to do it, uh, make sure that it's consistent across everything that you are providing to your recruiter team. I think we've touched on several really important points. And the one thing like I just want to even kind of air on or piggyback to is how you should have a LinkedIn profile, no matter, especially if you're trying to be a professional. It's not something you need to update every single day, but a strong LinkedIn profile needs to be there. And one thing that I'll even throw on there, there was a huge study that was done where they um, measured 125,000 resumes and their candidates and what happened within their hiring process. 74% of people that included an up-to-date LinkedIn profile on their resume received a call back and moved into the first round of interviews as opposed to people that did not. So you don't need to be like a social butterfly and having a million connections, but having that relevant information on there will definitely be a, a big value to you. But the other thing is, and this is kind of the reason, it's like the opposite end of uh, what we're touching on here, right? Many people on this panel are not super active on social media, which is fine, but you have to understand one thing, especially in this digital day and age, many employers may potentially look up your social media profiles or search your name on like the Facebooks, the Instagrams, just to see what comes up. And if you have some like really negative popping up under your name, that may be something that you want to think about possibly getting rid of or updating or fixing, because I guarantee you some hiring manager somewhere, I'm not saying they all do it, but some people are on social media. They may do a Google search and see what pops up. These are things that you may want to pay attention to in the grand scheme of things. So I don't think an, an online presence is going to be make or break for anybody. But it's definitely a tool that you could add to your tool belt that could possibly help. It just it won't hurt. I'll say that much. And it kind of brings me to this next question, right? And this has been asked a couple of different ways in the chat already. But hiring managers are looking for people with experience. Like most job offers for entry level are like two years of experience. But you need a job to get the experience. How can this conflict be resolved? Um, there are multiple companies that offer different programs for people who don't have the experience just yet. So the way I would suggest to approach it is internships, apprenticeships, returnships, all of those uh, are great opportunities that companies are nowadays offering even more and more. People coming from uh, different backgrounds or returning back to uh, the workforce or coming from a bootcamp because they're changing careers. There are good opportunities for you. Um, at Asana, we have an apprenticeship program. We have an internship program uh, where you have people coming for two months, six months, depending on the duration of the program. And it is likely that if you do a really good job, you're going to be able to have a full-time offer right after that period. So you don't have the experience prior. You can have the experience during this program. So they will allow you or they will actually help you train and get ready for you to be a full-time employee. I think this is one of the problems the industry has to uh, tackle relatively soon also is you can't have the expectation that your junior members are walking in with years of experience. Um, I think there is starting to be, there are some companies that are starting to recognize that. There are definitely hiring managers that are starting to recognize that. So I don't think it's all or nothing. The other piece is sometimes it takes a while for those job descriptions to catch up with how hiring managers are actually reacting. So don't let that hold you back, right? Don't let it be that you, if you don't meet out all those requirements, whatever flavor it is that you don't apply, just just apply, like do it, just send it in as long as it's not like crazy out of scope, right? But if they're saying two years experience and you're fresh out of school, send it in, see what happens because sometimes you're gonna move forward even if it feels like maybe you didn't meet everything that was on there. Yeah, and, and I'm big, I mean, listen, what I'm about to say is like, people argue with me and I'm not trying to cause an argument here. I'm on vacation. So like, I'm going to go have a margarita after this. What I'm saying is though, is that if you can afford it and there is something that is mission driven for you that you want to be a part of and donate your time, AKA volunteer for free to gain experience, do it. Now I'm not saying you should do it. If you're working four jobs, you're trying to provide for your family. I'm not saying you need to give up more time because that's, 
just that's too much. But what I'm saying is, is that I've had specific people. I've had one person, for example, um, intern for me. She helped project manage and create my webpage, Um, she, I Literally, she, because of the skills she learned with me, it was a little bit more in line with what she wanted to do full time. And we got her a job. My, like my Baco, the company I worked for, got her a job because of her experience from interning with me. And so, again, does it work for everybody? I've heard stories, no. But does it work for a lot of people? Yes. I've heard more stories that are success stories with people volunteering their time for free than not. But again, if you can't afford it. And listen, that's like three, five hours, one hour a week. It doesn't have to be 40 for the record. Yeah. And, you know, I've covered this quite a bit today as well. I mean, just apply. Worst case scenario, they say no. You're in the same position you were before. Best case scenario, they say yes. Or at the very least, you have an opportunity to have a conversation and show them how valuable you really are. Unless the role explicitly says senior developer, I think that's fair game as far as I'm concerned. One thing that I, and oftentimes you'll see if you're, for example, applying for a mid-level and you're a junior, they may be willing to create that role or keep your a resume on file for when that uh, junior role does open up, that up, opens up that opportunity to have a discussion. But make sure if you're applying for that role, you actually know the like this tech stack and the languages that they're looking for. If you're applying to a, a junior level job that asks for two years experience, but they're asking for Python and you know JavaScript, that's not going to be a good conversation for you. I don't care how you cut it up. That's not going to go in your favor. So we have this question here as a hiring manager. What qualifications do you look for in a candidate to actually move them to the next round? Anybody want to take this? Yeah. yeah. For, for me, um, I mean, depending on if we're talking more kind of entry level, um, you know, junior level roles at that point, uh, what I'm looking for is potential more than anything else, right? For, for anyone I'm, I'm hiring, I'm looking, do you know, uh, have you learned what you should have learned by this point, right? And when you're entry level, there's not a hell of a lot you should have learned by this point, right? I want you, if you're coming in for a coding position, right, I want you to know like base of variables, control structures, you know, a few other things along those lines. But I'm going to have to teach you most of the rest of it on the job anyways. I want to know that you have potential, that you're willing to grow and learn, that you understand that this is a career where you cannot sit still because you will stagnate if you do. Um, and I want that positive, enthusiastic attitude, someone who is not going to come and be a brilliant asshole or anything along those lines, right? Um, and that's what's going to get me to, to like not disqualify you from moving forward. At that point, if I've got a whole bunch of, of qualified candidate, it goes back to a lot of what we've talked about before around what's going to make you stand out more than anything. Um, I don't often care about particular tech stack as long as you're in the realm of what I need to know. So like you called out, Danny, if I'm looking for Python and you know JavaScript, that may not be the best fit. But if I'm looking for Python and you know Java, like there's a lot of similarities in any adjective oriented programming language. And there's enough that I feel like you'll be able to learn and grow from there. Um, so it's a it's a mixed bag, really, but I'm not often looking for some particular hard skill or anything along those lines. One thing that um, I like all of those examples, and, and and I'm gonna piggyback to something, which is I want to make sure that I see and I hear from you real examples, real life things that happens to you. Uh, one thing is to say I know data structures, I know uh, how this works, or or you have study because we already told you to prepare and you have prepared yourself and you can name concepts you know what the buzzwords are but one other thing is that you tell me how you have applied and even if it is small scope if it is a small example i want to know how you have done with them rather than you tell me a bunch of things that you learn a few weeks before to get ready for this interview i want to know how that applies because that's the only way we can know is this a good match for you how can we best assess what your skills are, what your experience is, and offer you something that will be good for you? Uh, don't lie. Make sure that you don't only show frameworks and talk about uh, ideas and definitions. Just actually bring your own uh, experience to the table. And listen, I'm not a hiring manager, but shameless self-plug here. I have a uh, morning show. It's called Guidance Counselor 2.0. Nancy, Denise, I'd love to have you on it. Danny's been on it. We're basically like interview engineering leads on how to scale teams, hire better, all that jazz. One of the biggest things I hear when hiring junior developers, the, 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 the good or, or, or early on in their career developers, 
basically it's like, Hey, listen, we don't expect much. Like the good hiring managers are saying that we just want somebody to walk through their code with us and just say, Hey, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And, and, and be able to just talk about it. Cause it sounds like the biggest issue when hiring isn't necessarily the technical skill set, it's the communication skill set. So again, not a hiring manager. That's just what I've learned interviewing people. And that's a shameless self plug. And that's all I got. One thing that I really want to kind of highlight here. Number one, a lot of useful information has been shared. Um, I highly recommend, you know, following all these amazing people on LinkedIn, but make sure if you walk into an interview, prepare two to three talking points that you know these are like your best, best points. I think if you're in a moment in the interview where you feel doubtful or nervous, or for example, if you're having to take a long pause, you can direct the conversation to where you feel strongest and really control and showcase a lot of the value that you can bring to that role. So maybe talking about a project that you've done that you can articulate, I've utilized these technologies, this is how I utilize them, this is how I solved a problem, that is gonna go a long way. Also talk about a time where maybe there was a big problem, this is the way you address that problem, the case study that you utilize to say, this is the problem that was filled, uh, I had, this is the reason why I solved it this way, and this is how I presented that solution. These are the kinds of things that help. and the. So the people saying like, you know, I wish more people thought like these three individuals. I love their mindsets, but I guarantee you more hiring managers do have this mindset than you believe they do. What's important, though, is you're bringing your part of the conversation to it. They don't need to be carrying the weight and opening a door for you. Give them a reason to open that opportunity. If they're doing all the heavy lifting to find out what the potential is in you and you're not bringing any potential yourself, it's a hard conversation for them to have and to see the hidden dime in them, right? Make that job easier for them. Lay that information correctly and easy to access. And I guarantee you those opportunities will change for you. Number one, thank you all so much for being a part of this. We are over time, but I didn't want to end the conversation on time. But really, really, you added a ton of value. Um, I know for a fact that you've impacted a lot of people here. And if there's any last words or any last things that you'd like to share with anybody? Just thank you, Danny, and happy anniversary, Taylor. This was fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Taylor. For real. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go hang on the beach now. That's it. Have fun. <laughs> All right, y'all. Have a great one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, and share your feedback, please. There are going to be more raffle prizes that we share just for completing these feedback forms. So if you haven't won yet, this is a great opportunity to kind of get in there because you're only com technically competing with the people that stay till the end, right? So between the two tracks, so hopefully that exponentially increases your opportunities to win some great prizes. So we'll be giving out some uh, swag bundles. We have some prizes and some cool stuff that you can have on there. Highly, highly recommend you doing that. I had an amazing experience hanging out with y'all. I love seeing the chat. Please, if you aren't following me on social media, follow. If you aren't subscribed to this YouTube channel, please do so. If you haven't already, please drop a like on this video. It helps out with you know other people seeing this content. And honestly, thank you so much for being here. You know, we do these events for the community. You are part of the community. And I had an amazing experience with all y'all. If I don't see you anytime soon, thank you for being part of DevFest North America. And we will see you. And if you haven't already, by the way, check out your local GDG chapters. They're doing amazing events all the time. Check out GDG and your city name. And I guarantee you'll find a great community of developers that want to hang out with you. All right, y'all. I'll see you next time. I had to highlight that. Check it out. And if we can drop the link to the feedback form in the chat so that way everybody can kind of get to that form, I think that'd be incredible as well.
there's the feedback link. And remember, check out your local GTGs.